uh, dedicate this uh, symposium to Alan's honor and and use it as a as a token of celebrate uh, celebration of of his remarkable life. Uh, and with that, with other uh, further ado, I would like to I would like us to start and uh, let me tell you a little bit about what's going to happen today. So we have. Uh, like I said, a terrific lineup. The way we uh, wanted to organize this uh, Zoom-based virtual uh, symposium is to divide this uh, into uh, several segments, two talks each, followed by a panel discussion with a panel consisting of two uh, two speakers. Now, unfortunately, you know, life uh, <laughs> and other duties uh, sometimes get on on the way uh, of fun stuff like uh, giving talks at the symposium. So first, the speakers will have to leave fairly promptly after the after their talks. And so they will take their questions right after uh, their uh, their talks are done. And and then we'll go back to the uh, to the radio programming, so to speak, uh, two talks and a panel, two talks and a panel. There will be a break in the middle. Uh, the way I would uh, suggest us asking questions is uh, if you have a question, Please type it in the in the chat room. I will be monitoring the chat room, and right after the uh, talk is over, I will probably call on some of you to voice your question. Uh, if you don't feel comfortable typing the question, please feel free to just shut it out. Uh, maybe raise your hand or just ask your question uh, right after the talk is over. Uh, but uh, but chat uh, chat feature is actually quite uh, quite helpful uh, from my personal experience. So without further ado, I would like to. Uh, invite our first uh, speaker. What, what, what a bad, better way to start uh, a symposium than uh, with a talk by a, 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 a good friend of mine, a phenomenal scientist, uh, Richard Kuwoki uh, from, um, uh, St. Jude Children's Research Hospital. Uh, uh, those of us who know Richard, uh, he doesn't need any introduction. He's a world leader and one of the pioneers uh, in understanding phase separation across biological uh, systems, a new concept that is, has been taken over the uh, research community uh, fairly quickly, a powerful concept. And, uh, and Richard was one of the, uh, has been one of the uh, pioneers of, of those studies. It's always a pleasure uh, to see to listen to uh, new ideas uh, from from Richard. And without further ado, uh, I would let you talk and show your beautiful data. Thank you. Thank you, Vadim, uh, for that very generous introduction and for that very, very moving tribute to your, uh, your colleague. Um, uh, it, it sounds like he, uh, he had a wonderful career and was surrounded by people who appreciated him as a friend and, and scientific colleague. Uh, and thank you for the invitation to speak to this group today. Uh, so I'm gonna speak about the role of liquid-liquid phase separation in the uh, diverse functions of the nucleolus. And uh, so this slide sort of illustrates the sort of scope of interests we have in my lab. So we're we're interested in understanding the, the structural and dynamic features of biomolecules and, and how these features mediate uh, interactions uh, that underlie the process of liquid-liquid phase separation. And importantly, biomolecules can, can interact uh, either with themselves or with, with um, other types of biomolecules to form weak and transient sort of networks, non-covalent networks between those molecules, which then uh, promotes uh, the process of phase separation, forming uh, sort of droplet-like condensates in vitro and forming membraneless organelles in cells. And so we're interested in uh, understanding physical basis for the formation of these structures and also understanding the, the roles they play, the functional roles they play in biological systems. So, uh, so today I'll give a, 
a brief introduction to phase separation in biology at the beginning. Then I'll talk about uh, this nucleolar protein called nucleophosmin uh, and talk about its role as a, an organizer of the nucleolus. And then uh, the latter part of the talk will address uh, tumor suppression by a small disordered protein called ARF, which exerts its tumor suppressor activities by integrating within the nucleolus and altering the fluid features of the nucleolus. Uh, I first want to acknowledge the, the major contributors to the work I'll discuss today. Uh, the, the ARF studies have been done uh, primarily by uh, Eric Gibbs, a, uh, a postdoc in the lab. And for the cell biology experiments I'll describe, uh, he's been supported by a very talented cell biologist in the lab, Chi Miao. And uh, the others pictured have contributed to uh, past and present studies. And I, in the interest of time, I'll just thank them, but not call them out individually. Uh, so phase separation. Uh, this is a process that is driven by weak and transient interactions between multivalent biomolecules. The process is exquisitely concentration dependent, temperature dependent, uh, solution conditions dependent. For example, ionic strength is a modulator of phase separation. As I said a moment ago, it leads to the formation of transient non-covalent networks between biomolecules. And I'll, I'll illustrate um, how we view uh, nucleolar networks that underlie phase separation a little bit later in the, in the lecture. Uh, this phase separation organizes biomolecules within cellular compartments to perform diverse biological functions. And it's, it's becoming appreciated that, you know, vast regions of the cell are organized into sort of membraneless compartments by um, different sets of biomolecules. And that much of bi biology is, is compartmentalized through phase separation. So just some simple terminology. So I'll be showing uh, some images of condensates that form in vitro. And the, uh, the interior of the condensates um, that's referred to as the dense phase. And the surrounding solution is referred to as the light phase or the dilute phase. And I'll refer to these structures either as droplets or condensates during my talk. So <clears throat> now a little bit about the nucleolus. So it's the site of ribosome biogenesis. And it's organized into three components or, or layers as shown schematically on the right. So at the very center um, is the, the fibrillar center. And this is where the genes that encode the ribosomal RNAs, which are tandemly repeated on five uh, acrocentric uh, chromosomes in humans, these genes are clustered together in the center of the nucleolus and then those genes are transcribed to, to yield pre-ribosomal RNAs um, as illustrated here. And so these uh, then interact with a protein called fibrillarin, which phase separates with those pre-ribosomal RNAs, forming the second layer of the nucleolus, which is called the dense fibrillar component. And in, in the DFC, the Pre-ribosomal RNAs are spliced and modified, giving rise to the to the mature RNA strands that um, uh, go into ribosomal subunits. Uh, and due to the constant transcription of these RNAs, they move outwards into the third layer called the granular component, where they phase separate with highly abundant protein nucleophosmin. So. Uh, so <clears throat> Now, while all this is happening from the inside out in the nucleolus, ribosomal proteins are being made in the cytosol, trafficked through the nuclear pore, and then interact with nucleophosmin, undergo phase separation with nucleophosmin, creating a, 
liquid-like environment for the assembly of ribosomal proteins with ribosomal RNAs producing ribosomal subunits, which then uh, diffuse out of the nucleolus to then assemble finally in the cytosol as intact ribosomes. Uh, so the, the sort of uh, the integrity of the nucleolus is tightly coupled to the cell cycle. So it's present during interphase, but it, it disassembles uh, during mitosis. And of course, it supports the metabolic demands uh, in growing cells. So <clears throat> shown here is a, is a schematic of the different types of membraneless organelles found in cells with the nucleolus being uh, the largest. And uh, it's been known to be sort of liquid-like and, to, and to, to have formed through the process of phase separation since the pioneering work of Cliff Branglin when he was a postdoc with Tony Hyman and at MPI in Dresden. It's shown here is, uh, is uh, our uh, stills of a video um, reported in 2011 showing uh, the liquid-like nature of, of nucleoli. So <clears throat> the sort of proper control of features of nucleoli is, is important um, for uh, for uh, maintaining cells uh, in sort of a, a normal state. So nuclear size is related to the level of ribosomal RNA uh, transcription and is controlled by growth factors and can be aberrantly controlled by genes produced, uh, by proteins produced by, by oncogenes. Uh, tumor suppressor proteins, for example, are uh, serve to modulate ribosome biogenesis. Uh, and nucleolar size and function also reflect functional changes in tumor suppressor proteins. So uh, shown on the right are uh, uh, images, EM images of normal cells and ARF deleted cells. So, so the ARF gene is either silenced or deleted in a large fraction of human cancers. And it's, 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 its role in sort of restraining uh, functions of the nucleolus can be seen uh, here where we have you know, a small nu nucleolus in the wild type cells and uh, very large nucleoli in the ARF deleted cell. And uh, so ARF, you know, as I said earlier, it integrates within the nucleolus and it, and it restrains its structure and and dynamics, and that can, can be seen from this comparison of images. Uh, in cancer, uh, the larger the size of the nucleolus, the worse is the prognosis for patients. And th this, I mean, basically in large nucleoli uh, is a hallmark of cancer cells and is, is very commonly used um, during the uh, uh, diagnosis uh, of cells from cancer patients. Uh, so, so I've shown here, so, so here um, I'm illustrating schematically sort of the role of ARF. Uh, so here's, here's the nucleolus, the green uh, uh, pentameric structures are nucleophosmin and ARF interacts with nucleophosmin and, and in, in normal cells, ARF is expressed at very low levels. And so it, it exerts a very sort of modest effect uh, on uh, nucleolar structure and dynamics. And as I illustrated in the previous slide, when ARF is, is, is lost, then nucleoli are enlarged and uh, they produce much larger amounts of ribosomes and drive uh, increased protein synthesis in those cells. Uh, alternatively, uh, ARF is expressed in cells in response to oncogenic stimuli, and therein it uh, interacts with nucleophosmin and restrains um, nucleolar structure, dynamics, and, and function. And so I'll, I'll present uh, uh, evidence supporting uh, this, this model. So 
to better understand the molecular basis for ARF tumor suppressive function in the nucleolus, we characterized its interactions with nucleophosmin. So nucleophosmin uh, is a pentameric protein with an N-terminal domain that is a, uh, a uh, uh, oligomerization domain illustrated here. At the C-terminus is a nucleic acid binding domain that forms a, a, uh, a compact helical domain, and this is responsible for binding to both uh, certain DNA structures as well as ribosomal RNA. And these two folded domains are connected by a 120 residue long intrinsically disordered region uh, that displays two uh, what we refer to as acidic tracts that are highly enriched in acidic residues, as you can see. And these acidic tracts then interact with clusters of arginine residues in other proteins. We refer to these as arginine-rich motifs. Uh, so for example, ribosomal proteins display clusters of arginine residues that can interact with these acidic tracts weakly and transiently uh, to form uh, non-covalent networks that underlie the process of phase separation. <clears throat> Nucleophosmin mediates multiple mechanisms of phase separation. So, uh, so shown at the top is, uh, is its pentameric structure. And um, note that not only does it have acidic tracts illustrated with the red shading, but um, these are uh, sort of linked together by uh, basic tracts. Their, their, their charge density is lower than the acidic tracts, but still they're distinctly uh, positive, positively charged. Uh, and so the, these, uh, these tracts of oppositely charged uh, disordered residues then enable interpentameric interactions that under slightly crowded conditions lead to what is referred to as homotypic liquid-liquid phase separation. But uh, through uh, the activity of the, of the uh, C-terminal uh, RNA binding domains, nucleophosmin can interact in a multivalent fashion with ribosomal RNA and undergo phase separation. Uh, and then finally, the third mechanism is uh, interaction of the, of the acidic tracts in the pentameric structure with arginine motifs in other proteins uh, to mediate um, uh, a second type of uh, heterotypic phase separation. So nucleophosmin mediates homotypic phase separation as well as two types of heterotypic um, phase separation. Um, and these interactions uh, we thought uh, could be altered by ARF during oncogenic stress events when it integrates within nucleoli. So shown here are the features of the ARF protein. So it's called P14 ARF in humans, um, and it is uh, disordered in solution. Uh, so it's about 100, it's, it's 132 amino acids in length, and its distinguishing features are that it has um, three uh, arginine-rich regions as illustrated, R1, 2, 3, uh, and these then interact with the acidic, acidic tracts in nucleophosmin. Uh, however, ARF also displays three uh, clusters of hydrophobic residues that you'll see are really important in governing uh, its interactions with, with nucleophosmin and the effects that it has on uh, uh, nucleoli. Uh, and uh, if you analyze the sequence of ARF using secondary structure predictor, uh, some will indicate the potential for uh, two short beta strands and a region of alpha helix. And I'll come back to these features a little bit later in the talk. Uh, so does ARF drive phase separation with nucleophosmin? Yes, it does uh, quite uh, potently. 
Uh, so shown at the top are fluorescence microscopy images of condensates that result from the mixing of ARF with uh, nucleophosmin um, with phase separation occurring in the, uh, in the high nanomolar uh, range. Uh, so this ARF being titrated into a fixed concentration of nucleophosmin, which is probably about five micromolar or so. Um, which, which is a concentration that is relevant to uh, nucleophosmin's concentration in nucleoli. ARF has a very profound effect on the dynamics of molecules uh, uh, within nucleoli and, and effects on, on nucleophosmin within condensates in vitro, as shown here. So this is a single condensate formed um, by nucleophosmin mixed with ARF. And after bleaching of a region of these condensates, we see that recovery is, is uh, incomplete and very, very slow. Um, and uh, these condensates do not um, uh, fuse and round up. Uh, and so these are, these are gel-like condensates. Under when when mixed with other types of nucleolar proteins with arginine motifs, nucleophosmin usually forms very fluid, highly fusy uh, condensates. And so these properties of of the ARF NPM condensates are quite distinct. So to uncover the molecular basis of nucleophosmin's immobilization within condensates, we turn to NMR. Uh, spectroscopy. Uh, so <clears throat> ARF, ARF is a really sticky protein due to those hydrophobic regions, and it is horribly behaved in uh, sort of normal physiological buffers. Uh, and so we resort to dissolving the protein in 100% DMSO, and we're able to observe NMR resonances in this 2D HSQC spectrum for uh, all of all of the resonances and the the assignment coverage is illustrated by the green bars uh, on the right above the uh, the primary sequence uh, shown on the bottom. Uh, when dissolved in four molar urea, uh, resonances from the N-terminal region that con contains the hydrophobic residues are not uh, visible uh, due to self-association, even in the presence of four molar uh, urea. We've uh, been able to analyze the structural conformational features of ARF within condensates with nucleophosmin. And under these conditions, uh, we're able to uh, we're able to uh, observe only the uh, C-terminal most residues. Uh, the rest of the protein is is you know essentially immobilized when it's interacting with nucleophosmin in the context of uh, condensates. And uh, so we needed to. Uh, resort to using solid state NMR to resolve other regions of ARF within uh, these condensates. And quite remarkably, we were able to observe resonances for uh, the N-terminal region, which uh, was undetectable by any of the, uh, in any of the conditions we used using solution-based NMR. Uh, spectroscopy and uh, and my postdoc Eric was able to extract uh, uh, secondary information on secondary structure within the condensates from uh, C13 chemical shift values and uh, interestingly we see two regions of beta strand and a region of alpha helix corresponding to the secondary structure uh, prediction based on sequence uh, that I noted uh, earlier. And by preparing a sample 
with uh, equal parts N15 labeled ARF and C13 labeled ARF, again, within condensates with nu unlabeled nucleophosmin, he was able to detect a, a small number of intermolecular contacts between the polypeptides, supporting the role of the hydrophobic residues in, uh, in uh, ARF in governing, uh, uh, governing uh, homotypic interactions within condensates in addition to the heterotypic interactions uh, uh, <clears throat> with nucleophosmin. So to summarize this part of the talk, ARF is an arginine-rich protein that experiences hydrophobic self-association. ARF forms gelated droplets with nucleophosmin that immobilize both proteins. And uh, we hypothesize that together with interactions uh, of its arginine motifs with nucleophosmin, uh, ARF's hydrophobic self-association mediates uh, molecular immobilization and uh, droplet gelation. So we have these homotypic interactions, essentially increasing the multivalence of ARF, and then its, its clusters of arginine residue, residues are interacting with acidic tracts uh, in nucleophosmin. So Vadim, how, how are we doing on time? How much time do I have left? Uh, let's see. Um, uh, well, you, you have like 10 minutes. Okay, great. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, that's perfect, actually. Uh, so to, to, you know, sort of test the hypothesis that the hydrophobic features of ARF are uh, mediating its gelation of nucleophosmin condensates, we uh, used mutagenesis then to alter our hydrophobic features. Uh, so we mutated uh, basically all of the, the hydrophobic residues in these clusters to uh, alanines, I think, and then uh, studied uh, the properties of this mutant protein uh, upon interaction with nucleophosmin and the formation of condensates. So the, this, this mutant protein called Delta HR123 readily forms uh, condensates with nucleophosmin. These condensates are uh, fuse readily and are very sort of dynamic condensates. And uh, the NPM molecules within these uh, condensates with mutant ARF um, are highly mobile as shown by uh, very rapid recovery and an almost complete recovery after photobleaching in comparison to the slow uh, recovery in the presence of wild type ARF. So, so, <clears throat> so our, you know, our in vitro data um, suggested strongly that ARF may be acting in the nucleolus to restrain the mobility of nucleophosmin and, and to, uh, to re rigidify uh, the interior or, or this, this outer granular comp component region of the nucleolus. And so to extend our studies into cells, we engineered um, this DLD1 colorectal or adenocarcinoma cell line uh, to stably express uh, GFP uh, tagged nucleophosmin, and then we used uh, lentiviral vectors to introduce an, in, an inducible uh, form of either wild type ARF with a with an IRFP uh, tag or the mutant delta HR one two three ARF again with an IR, IRFP tag, and then we investigated the uh, effects of these two forms of ARF on nucleophosmin diffusion in nucleoli and on cell viability. And so shown here are Eric's uh, FRAP results uh, with uh, the cells expressing, again, uh, 
uh, GFP tagged nucleophosmin and uh, wild type ARF. And as we saw in in vitro condensates, uh, we see that uh, ARF restrains the mobility uh, of itself and of nucleophosmin in uh, nucleoli in these cells. In contrast, expression of the delta HR123 mutant of ARF um, has very little effect on uh, the mobility of nucleophosmin and itself is highly mobile. And this we believe is because this mutant doesn't experience the you know, homotypic ARF-ARF interactions that make it um, more highly multivalent and then allow it to be more extensively entangled with uh, nucleophosmin. So what are the, what are the effects um, of uh, ARF and this HR123 mutant on uh, NPM diffusion in cells? Uh, in in nu nucleoli, uh, so uh, so Eric extracted diffusion coefficients from his FRAP data, and so here's the value for nucleophosmin diffusion in nucleoli in the absence of expression of ARF, and then he saw a ARF concentration dependent uh, reduction in nucleophosmin's mobility, uh, and this was done by establishing stable cell lines that express different levels of the ARF protein upon induction with doxycycline. And, uh, and uh, so this was manifested uh, as uh, a, a slight decrease in the mobile fraction of nucleophosmin within nucleoli. And importantly, this was associated with uh, a decline concentration dependent decline in cell viability uh, as a function of expression of ARF. In contrast, the HR123 mutant um, uh, maybe even slightly increased nucleophosmin mobility in nucleoli, didn't alter nucleophosmin's uh, mobile fraction in nucleoli and had no effect on cell viability. So ARF restricts nucleophosmin's diffusion within nucleoli and inhibits cell proliferation in a concentration-dependent manner. Uh, does ARF expression affect ribosome biogenesis? Uh, so uh, shown here is a schematic of, of uh, what's referred to as a polysome assay, where um, by sedimenting um, uh, ribosomes, extracted from cells, you can fractionate them into uh, ribos individual ribosomal submutants, ADS monosomes, as well as polysomes, which are multiple ribosomes uh, actively translating on mRNA. And so Chi um, uh, Miao, uh, assisting Eric, uh, performed the polysome assay uh, results are performed polysome assays, and the results are shown here. So in the cells um, uh, expressing ARF, we see uh, a dramatic reduction in active, actively translating polysomes and an accum dramatic accumulation of ADS monosomes. So co compare the, the blue trace, uh, which is the 48-hour time point for uh, control cells versus the red trace, uh, you can see this dramatic change in the, the ribosome profile, indicating that this is probably the reason for the uh, reduced viability of cells expressing ARF. So uh, now I'd like to, to conclude and wrap up. Uh, so P14R forms gel-like condensates with nucleophosmin in vitro. Uh, ARF restricts nucleophosmin diffusion in nucleoli, inhibits ribosome biogenesis, and reduces cell viability. Uh, so we propose that uh, P14ARF acts as a modulator of nucleolar fluidity, uh, and essentially uh, what we think is going on is, is that 
uh, tumor suppression uh, in cells uh, expressing ARF is via molecular immobilization uh, within the nucleolus. Uh, so um, uh, finally, I'd like to again acknowledge contributions from group, group members, especially Eric Gibbs, um, who really single-handedly has done all of the sort of biophysical studies that I discussed, and he has been uh, assisted tremendously by uh, Chi Miao in the lab. And I thank you all for your, uh, for your kind attention. And I'll be happy to address questions if there are any at this point. All right, thank you, Richard. Thank you so much. So we have a, a couple of questions in the in the chat room. Uh, I think uh, uh, Professor Vivek Chinoy, Vivek, do you want to uh, voice your question? Yeah, sure. Uh, so that's a great talk. I really enjoyed it. So uh, I was just wondering. So uh, have you looked at uh, you know when phase separated systems you have Ostwald ripening, and in the beginning of the talk I saw a number of these domains in the nucleolus. Do they coarsen and do they Ostwald ripen, or there are other factors that prevent them from doing so. Um, no, they don't. They don't. Um, they don't exhibit Ostwald ripening. Uh, certainly, in vitro condensates do, um, but the um, you know I think there's there are active processes okay. occurring within the nucleolus constantly which um, really, I guess, counteract, uh, you know, the, the effects of, of Ostwald ripening. I mean, it's an extremely dynamic system with, the, with, with um, uh, transcription of ribosomal RNA constantly occurring, and there's constant flux of ribosomal proteins into the nucleolus. Um, I, you know, I don't, I don't know the rate of ribosome production in cells, but ribosomes are, are, are something like uh, half or, or, or three quarters of the mass of a cell. And so there's, this, there's just massive flux through the nucleolus constantly in a, in a uh, normal interphase uh, cell. Thanks. Uh, yeah, I was going to be talking about a related topic, uh, methylation and acetylation <laughs> later on. So that's why I was just wondering okay. if similar concepts hold here as well. Uh, thanks. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for the question. And I, uh, and I think there's another question from uh, Rania, Rania Burr from Northwestern. Hi. Um, yeah, great talk. Um, I, I was wondering, um, since it seems that the N, um, NMP1 confirmation is dependent on, um, I think you showed the, the sodium chloride or salt concentration, if you've looked at kind of the combined effects of salt um, on, I guess, the, the ARF um, NMP1 induced phase separation. We have, we have not, um, you know, done salt titrations with the ARF uh, NPM system. Um, I think in general, Eric uses, you know, PDS, you know, standard sort of buffers that, that mimic, you know, cellular physiology. Um, but we, we certainly have done, um, uh, have probed the salt dependence, salt concentration dependence of nucleophosmins phase separation behavior with other um, types of nucleolar components uh, in the past. And, and of course, um, it, since, since the interactions are largely driven by charge-charge um, uh, uh, electrostatic interactions, um, phase separation is really exquisitely sensitive to uh, changes in uh, salt concentration. And, and interestingly, the pentameric structure of nucleophosmin itself is um, very sensitive to salt concentration because um, I didn't mention this, but there's, there's actually a ring of acidic residues in the pentamerization domain in addition to the acidic tracts in the intrinsically disordered region. And if you drop below physio physiological salt concentration, the, the pentamerization domain builds up electrostatic repulsion and 
like at about like 50 millimolar in ACL, it will actually unfold. And we showed some years ago that um, that unfolding could be modulated by uh, acidic residue mutations that mimic uh, phosphorylation because there are multiple phosphorylation sites within that pentamerization domain. And we, we proposed that, um, uh, that, it, that the integrity of the pentamerization domain is regulated by, um, by phosphorylation, uh, for example, in sync with um, cell division. Well, thank, th thank you, Richard. Thank you so much. I know you have to you have to go. Uh, so if you if you're able to join us later on, that would be great. Uh, thank you so much. Let's let's give a virtual round of applause, Richard. <laughs> thank you. thank you very much, Vadim. I uh, I hope everybody enjoyed enjoyed hearing about nucleophosmin and and ARF. Absolutely. And uh, and um, yes, yeah, so I will I will leave you now. And it, if um, if I'm able, I'll. Uh, join at 1050 for the for the panel so thank you so, so sounds wonderful thank you so much richard uh so we are uh we're going to go with the second talk uh maliki lacadamiali uh from the perlman uh school of uh, medicine at the university of pennsylvania uh we'll talk about the convergence of uh engineering methods such as super resolution microscopy and the uh, uh, molecular genomics uh the, in 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 genomic community, uh, there, are, there are those investigators who work on tool development. They just develop tools such as super resolution microscopy or ultra electron microscopy, et cetera, et cetera. And there are those who deploy those techniques to understand the underlying biology. And in many times you don't see one lab uh, uh, in, been involved in on both fronts. And Maliki's lab is one of those rare uh, rare convergent uh, or convergence uh, labs where uh, Maliki works on both fronts at the same time and, and she has done beautiful work on both technology development, uh, quantitative biophysical understanding of the molecular machinery of the genome and also understanding the underlying biology, especially in intracellular trafficking and the, the uh, transcriptional machinery that drives uh, gene expression. And uh, I'm very much looking forward uh, to your talk, Miliki. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, thank you, Vadim, for the really, really kind introduction and for the invitation. It's really a pleasure for me um, to be here um, and to, to present our work. Um, and I'm really uh, sorry that I cannot stay up my talk. I think this is a feature or maybe a bug of giving talks over Zoom where you can hop from one conference, one symposium to another. Um, so unfortunately, I have to run to another conference, um, but I'm happy to take uh, questions at the end. Um, so just to start with a broad overview of what I do in my lab, we are interested in this general question of how a cell is organized in space and in time. And we're studying this question uh, from a couple of different perspectives. So um, as Vadim mentioned, we're interested in um, the um, um, role of cytoskeleton and motor proteins in transporting and spatially organizing the cytoplasm, in particular organelles within the cytoplasm. We're also interested in nuclear architecture, in particular the organization of chromatin within the nucleus and how that regulates gene activity. And um, as Vadim said, we also try to develop new methods uh, that allow us to study these questions with high spatial resolution and at quantitative detail. And of course, today I'm going to uh, focus on our work on chromatin organization. I don't need to introduce this audience to chromatin. As you know, it's a complex structure that spans several length scales. And these uh, small length scales in the order of 10 to 100 nanometers are uh, very important for regulating gene activity. So as you can imagine, if DNA is within these compact structures, it's inaccessible to regulatory proteins and polymerases. So to be transcribed, the chromatin must unfold, making the DNA more easily accessible. So in my lab, we're very interested in uh, visualizing uh, these length scales inside intact nuclei. 
and in particular, um, understanding how these link scales are remodeled as genes are activated and repressed. And doing this is not straightforward, especially using light microscopy, which is the main tool that uh, we use in my lab. Um, um, these are link scales that are uh, below the resolution limit, below the diffraction limit. And so to overcome this problem, uh, we use super resolution microscopy, in particular, single molecule based methods like STORM. Um, and um, I am sure that most people here are familiar with these um, super resolution methods. Um, so I'm not gonna spend too much time describing how they work. I just wanna overview uh, with one slide. And I hear some feedback um, or, or um, noise. So uh, if I can ask everyone to mute their uh, microphones, um, that would be great. Um, so um, in, uh, here I'm showing you a, a, a white field image of um, microtubules. Um, and you can see that this image is quite blurry and, and pixelated uh, due to the diffraction limit and the low spatial resolution of a light microscope. Um, in storm type super resolution microscopy uh, that relies on single molecule detection, uh, what we do is uh, we label the structure of interest with photo switchable fluorophores. These are fluorophores that can um, switch between bright and dark states. Um, and so the idea is to use light illumination to switch the fluorophores off into a dark state so that they're not visible. And then using light illumination of a different wavelength, switch on just a few fluorophores at a time such that they're spatially separated. So in this movie, each one of these uh, blobs that is flashing is an individual fluorophore, which we can identify. And we can also find um, the position of these fluorophores by finding the center position of the blob. Um, and we can put a dot to represent the position of each fluorophore. And over time, uh, by activating new fluorophores, um, finding their positions and collecting more dots, we can reconstruct a high resolution image of the underlying structure, which is no longer limited by diffraction. Now, uh, when we apply this methods to a biological question, um, we typically face a couple of challenges. Uh, one of them is to uh, find a way to label um, our um, structure of interest with these uh, uh, photo switchable fluorophores. So in the case of, uh, for example, DNA, we can't simply use DAPI because DAPI is not photo switchable. Um, and uh, a bigger challenge is to make sense of these images, uh, quantitative sense. Um, so these are not your typical intensity-based images. Um, in fact, what we have uh, is basically um, a list of positions, X, Y, and if we are doing 3D imaging, Z positions of fluorophores. Um, and we need to extract meaningful quantitative information uh, from that point uh, um, list. Um, and so my lab spends quite a lot of time trying to um, develop ways of uh, quantitatively analyzing and extracting biologically meaningful information from these images. So what I wanna do uh, in the next couple of slides is to walk you through um, some of the toolbox that we built over the last several years in applying um, super resolution microscopy to visualize chromatin organization with high spatial resolution and in a quantitative way. And I will tell you about a new story um, on how uh, uh, mechanical inputs can uh, modulate uh, chromatin nanostructure. Um, so, as I mentioned, uh, our first challenge is to find a way to label our structure of interest so that we can uh, visualize it using super resolution microscopy. One way to do that is to use antibody labeling, uh, for example, to label uh, histone proteins like H2B, which is one of the core histone proteins that incorporates into the nucleosome. Um, and in this way, we can visualize uh, nucleosomes. Um, and we label these antibodies uh, in-house with photo switchable fluorophores so that we can get good photo switching for super resolution microscopy. Um, and here I'm showing you side by side, again, a white field fluorescence image and a super resolution image of the uh, nucleosomes in the same uh, human fibroblast nucleus. Um, and this super resolution image in this case uh, is color coded 
according to the local uh, density of nucleosomes, red corresponding to high local density and blue corresponding to low local density. And I hope you can appreciate already visually that we do improve the spatial resolution dramatically by using super resolution microscopy. It now becomes quite clear that nucleosomes are not just um, randomly and uniformly distributed everywhere inside the nucleus, but in fact, there are quite a lot of local heterogeneities in uh, nucleosome distribution. And in particular, you can see this ring at the nuclear periphery um, of high uh, nucleosome density. This is expected because we know that um, silenced heterochromatin, which is compact, is at the nuclear uh, periphery. And we can capture this as high local density of nucleosomes. But heterochromatin is not just at the nuclear periphery, it's also inside the nucleus. And in particular, we have these local hot spots inside the nucleus corresponding to high nucleosome density. And again, using very quantitative methods, we showed that these are actually groups of nucleosomes. We call these nucleosome clutches. I will talk uh, briefly about this in the next slide. Now, another way to visualize chromatin is to directly label the DNA itself. And we do that by um, incubating the cells with nucleotide analogs like EDU or ADC. Um, and these nucleotide analogs incorporate into the DNA uh, through multiple cycles of DNA replication. We can then fix the cell and use click chemistry to click a photoswitchable fluorophore directly to the nucleotide analog. So we can directly label the entire genome, the entire DNA and visualize it with super resolution microscopy. And we get very similar information from these type of images. Again, you see that ring um, of high local DNA density at the nuclear periphery, as well as these local hot spots um, that correspond to, again, a high local folding and compaction of DNA within the nuclear interior. Um, so again, over the years, by applying these tools and using quantitative analysis, we came to this understanding of uh, chromatin organization within the nucleus um, that is somewhat different from the textbook model that I showed you in my first slide, um, where you have this very ordered hierarchical folding from a 10 nanometer to a 30 nanometer fiber to higher order structures, we actually think that chromatin organization within an intact nucleus is quite a bit more heterogeneous. Um, we think chromatin is a disordered fiber um, composed of these groups of nucleosomes that can be quite heterogeneous in terms of their size. They can range anywhere between a few nucleosomes to a few hundred nucleosomes. So in genomic scales, that's a few kilobases to a few tens of kilobases. As I said, we call these nucleosome clutches, like egg clutches, that can also be quite heterogeneous. Um, and um, the packing density of nucleosomes within these clutches can also be quite heterogeneous. And we think that they have implications for gene activity because we showed that uh, things like RNA polymerase II are actually more closely associated to small, less densely compacted nucleosome clutches. And recently we showed that nascent RNA is also in close proximity of these uh, smaller, less densely compacted nucleosome clutches, suggesting that they are uh, likely more transcriptionally active regions of chromatin. Now, in our images, we can also extract patterns that are larger than nucleosome clutches corresponding to multiple nucleosome clutches coming in close proximity and forming larger uh, domains. Um, and I'm calling these clutch domains for now, for lack of better uh, term. In terms of their size, um, they're in the same size range as a topologically associating domain, so a few hundred kilobases to um, megabases. But of course, in our imaging so far, we don't have sequence specificity. So we don't know if um, you know, uh, these correspond to specific domains um, that have been identified with alternative methods. And so we're working on now combining methods like oligopaint to paint different domains within the nucleus, like TAT, um, and combine it with um, super-res imaging of uh, nucleosomes to try to understand what is the nucleosome level folding. Um, an organization of uh, these type of domains. Now, um, despite this heterogeneity and this more sort of disordered organization of chromatin within the nucleus, we also showed that um, chromatin organization at this nanoscale level is actually highly cell type specific. 
and can be modulated uh, with both chemical and mechanical cues. And I'm gonna spend the rest of my time trying to explain to you what I mean by that. Um, and so here I'm showing you again, the same image I showed you earlier, uh, where you see DNA labeled in this case um, in a human fibroblast nucleus. Um, and next to it, I'm showing you another human fibroblast nucleus that has been treated with an epigenetic drug called TSA. This is a potent inhibitor of the HDAC enzyme. Um, and so the end result of this treatment is that we get massive accumulation of acetylation on histone tails um, and um, decompaction or opening up of chromatin and increase in transcriptional activity. And here I'm showing you some zoom ups uh, into these two nuclei. And again, I hope visually you can appreciate that this treatment actually dramatically changes uh, nanoscale chromatin organization. And we have showed the exact same thing by using nucleosome imaging as well as DNA imaging. Um, so you can see here that the local hotspots, those nucleosome clutches become smaller and more uh, dispersed inside the nuclear interior, um, corresponding to this opening up of uh, chromatin structure. And we can quantitatively capture this. So here is a plot uh, where I'm plotting the local density of DNA inside the nucleus. Um, and green plot corresponds to control cells and magenta plot plot to TSA treated cells. And you can see this shift um, to the left uh, in DNA density. Um, so after TSA treatment, the density becomes lower and we can quantitatively uh, capture this. Um, we can also measure clutch size and find that the clutch size becomes smaller after TSA treatment. Now, interestingly, um, we showed in collaboration with um, Rob Mauck's lab that um, in certain cell types, if you treat their nuclei with TSA and you have this dramatic reorganization of chromatin, the nuclei of uh, the mechanics of the nucleus also changes. So these cells, uh, the nucleus becomes softer and they can actually migrate um, through uh, porous um, environments more easily. And so this prompted us to ask the question of what about the other way around? Can we manipulate the mechanical environment of a cell um, and um, can this be sensed by the nucleus and modulate chromatin organization? And so again, we teamed up with several people at Penn, um, including Rob Mauck, um, Vivek Shenoy, um, and uh, Jason Burdick um, to uh, address this question. And so we grew cells, um, in this case, mesenchymal stem cells on um, substrates of uh, varying stiffness. Um, uh, for example, glass or uh, hydrogels uh, that are stiff, 30 kilopascals, or soft, 3 kilopascals. Um, and again, you may wonder, why is this um, relevant? Um, we know that tissue resident cells can experience very different mechanical environments. Um, for example, a bone is much stiffer uh, than brain tissue. And we know that these type of um, um, mechanical environments influence uh, cell phenotype. And so we wondered if those um, changes in cell phenotype are embedded in changes uh, at the level of nuclear organization. And so we used super resolution microscopy to visualize the chromatin of these cells growing under uh, different substrates. And again, I hope um, visually you can appreciate that chromatin does undergo dramatic remodeling um, 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 on uh, uh, substrates that have different stiffness. In particular, on soft substrates, chromatin seems to be dramatically um, sort of spatially reorganized such that we have uh, much more chromatin at the nuclear periphery uh, compared to other substrates. Um, and again, we can um, quantify this. Um, so if we look at the total amount of detected nucleosomes, in this case, we're labeling nucleosomes, um, on these different substrates in the entire nucleus, we find that the number of detected nucleosomes per unit area of the nucleus does not change under these different substrates. So we are looking at and visualizing the same amount of chromatin. 
But what we see is that if we look at um, the inner part of the nucleus, so if we segment just the inner part versus the outer peripheral part of the nucleus, um, on soft substrates, we have uh, much less chromatin on the inner part of the nucleus and a corresponding increase in chromatin uh, amount at the nuclear periphery. We know that nuclear periphery, again, is a silencing hub. So we also looked at chromatin compaction and whether there are changes in chromatin compaction. We split chromatin into two compartments, a sparse euchromatin compartment corresponding to these more blue regions in the images and a condensed heterochromatin compartment corresponding to uh, more of these red regions. And again, you can see that compared to stiff substrates, on soft substrates, we have an increase in uh, chromatin compaction, uh, both for the sparse compartment and the condensed compartment. Um, so this prompted us to look at um, epigenetic modifications. Uh, oh, and before I get to that, sorry, these changes happen quite rapidly. Um, so to show this, we use these really cool hydrogels that were developed in Jason Burdick's lab um, that can be, um, uh, their, their stiffness can be dynamically changed from soft to stiff uh, by cross-linking with light. Um, and so uh, we have cells that are growing on a three kilopascal soft substrate. Um, and upon uh, cross-linking with light, we can dynamically change the stiffness to 30 kilopascals. And here you see snapshots at different time points after stiffening. And again, you see this uh, dramatic relocalization of chromatin from the border nuclear periphery to the nuclear interior over time, uh, which we can again capture quantitatively as a decrease in the amount of chromatin at the nuclear border um, and a decrease in chromatin compaction. Um, so we're comparing chromatin compaction uh, to the starting time point. And you can see that already at four hours after stiffening, we have um, this decrease in chromatin compaction. Um, and then uh, following that, uh, we see a relocalization of chromatin uh, to the nuclear interior from the nuclear border. So these changes happen quite rapidly. Um, and uh, again, because nuclear periphery is a silencing hub and we see changes in compaction, this prompted us to look at epigenetic modifications. And we looked at um, H3K4ME3, which is a marker of active euchromatin. Chromatin, and H3K27ME3, which is a marker of silenced heterochromatin. Um, and we see on soft substrates that there is a decrease in the amount of uh, H3K4ME3 mark um, and um, an increase in the H3K27ME3, especially at the nuclear border, at the nuclear periphery, where we see most of the chromatin localized on soft substrates. Um, and so indeed, these changes in spatial organization of chromatin and its compaction go hand in hand uh, with changes in epigenetic modifications. And so then we ask the question of, um, you know, are these epigenetic uh, modifications um, responsible for uh, the spatial reorganization that we see? So to look at this, uh, we use again uh, GSK, an inhibitor of EZH2. Now EZH2 is the metal transferase that uh, deposits H3K27ME3, the silencing mark. And so we inhibit it, uh, EZH2 with GSK. And here I'm showing you control cells uh, grown on, again, glass, stiff, and soft substrates. And you see on soft substrates, uh, the spatial remodeling of chromatin as expected. If we inhibit GSK, now the cells become insensitive to substrate stiffness. They no longer remodel uh, their chromatin, especially on soft substrates. Um, so um, changes in these epigenetic marks seem to influence the spatial organization and positioning of uh, chromatin. And to dig into this further, we collaborated with Vivek Chanoy, um, and he's going to tell you in just a little bit in much more detail about the model that he has developed um, to um, uh, you know, um, uh, 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 explain these observations that we have in our experiments. And in this model, in addition to uh, modeling the energetics of chromatin lamina and chromatin-chromatin interactions, 
Vivek also incorporated um, rates of methylation and acetylation, which leads to a conversion between euchromatin and heterochromatin. And in the model, these rates are substrate stiffness dependent. And here I'm showing you again um, the uh, comparison between experimental results and the model predictions for a stiff, stiff substrate and a soft substrate. Um, and the difference is in the model is that on the soft substrate, we have increased rate of methylation. And you can see indeed that um, just like our experimental results, uh, the uh, model predicts an increased localization of chromatin at the nuclear border on soft substrates as a result of increased levels of methylation. Um, and if we inhibit those um, changes again to simulate what happens with GSK treatment, once again, we predict, uh, the model predicts that um, that difference between the nuclear border and the nuclear interior um, is abrogated. So um, chromatin no longer uh, becomes localized at the nuclear border. So these results suggest to us that um, these rates of methylation and acetylation, these epigenetic modifications actually have a direct bearing on the physical structure and the spatial positioning of chromatin within the nucleus. And again, um, Vivek will tell you in much more detail about the model. Now, why is this relevant? Again, I told you that physiologically substrate stiffness is important, but it's also pathologically important. And we know that in certain diseases, um, the uh, structure of the tissue and the mechanics of the tissue that the cells are embedded in can change. And one of those diseases is tendonitis. Um, so this is um, a, a disease that is caused by overloading and overuse of the tendon that leads to changes in tendon structure and mechanics. And so we isolated human tenocytes. Um, these are uh, cells that reside inside the tendon from a young healthy individual, as well as from an individual that suffers from tendonitis. And we visualize their chromatin organization and to our big surprise, um, the nuclei um, coming from the tendonitis patient had a chromatin uh, nanoscale organization that is very reminiscent of cells grown on soft substrate with increased amount of chromatin at the nuclear border, um, as well as increased chromatin compression. And even more surprising, if we take the cells from young patients, and we grow them uh, on these different substrates to um, sort of um, resemble a disrupted mechanical uh, sort of microenvironment. Um, we can actually change the chromatin organization of these young tenocytes. Again, on soft substrates, the chromatin becomes sequestered at the nuclear periphery and the uh, chromatin compaction increases. So we can make the um, healthy young cells look like diseased cells um, if we grow them on um, uh, uh, soft uh, substrates. Um, and again, even more surprising, at least to me, was the uh, following experiment. So we took um, you know, either um, uh, young healthy tenocytes or tenocytes from tendonitis patients, and we grew them on these stiffening hydrogels where we can change the stiffness from three to 30 kilopascals. And um, here I'm showing you again, images at different time points after stiffening for young healthy cells as well as tendonitis cells. And you can see that the young cells actually adapt to their mechanical microenvironment. So if we stiffen, um, then we see the changes in chromatin organization where the chromatin becomes relocalized to the nuclear interior and uh, decompacted. Uh, but the, health, uh, the, the cells coming from the tendonitis patient lose their mechanical sensitivity. They no longer respond to these changes in their mechanical uh, microenvironment. And again, we can capture these uh, quantitatively. You can see this relocalization of chromatin into the nuclear interior from the nuclear border uh, for young healthy cells, but not for tendonitis uh, cells. And again, there's decompaction uh, of chromatin um, in young healthy cells uh, upon stiffening, uh, but tendonitis cells have a much a more, uh, uh, much less uh, response, um, especially at the nuclear border, uh, the chromatin uh, no longer becomes decompacted. So they lose uh, their sensitivity. 
Now, um, all of this was quite uh, exciting to us um, to um, uh, realize that you know the nanoscale organization of chromatin is highly cell type dependent and is remodeled um, in disease. So we wondered, um, can we classify cells based on their chromatin nanostructure, chromatin organization? And to do that, we have been collaborating uh, with the group of um, Jerome Solon um, to develop machine learning based algorithms uh, to uh, classify cells based on these chromatin images. Um, and uh, again, I'm not gonna go into too much detail, but in this um, uh, model, we first um, extract features um, uh, spatial features uh, from the chromatin images. These features may correspond to small features like nucleosome clutches, as well as larger features like clutch domains, uh, as well as other patterns. Um, and then we train uh, the model uh, by showing it images of different cell types, for example, human fibroblast cells or human fibroblast cells treated with TSA. Um, and the computer looks at the features um, in these different cell types um, and makes a histogram of what are the features that are overrepresented in these different cell types. We can then um, give the algorithm uh, images that it has not seen before and ask it to classify uh, these cells. And we have done this for human fibroblasts and TSA treated human fibroblasts again as a proof of concept. It works really well, but we have also done it for other cell types. So for example, naive uh, stem cells versus neuronal progenitor cells that are more differentiated. And you can see that the computer can classify them based on their chromatin nano organization uh, with very high accuracy. Um, and we have even taken this a step further, looked at cells uh, that have certain mutations um, that uh, change their chromatin uh, nanoscale organization or cells that are stem cells that are grown in serum that make them primed to differentiate. And again, we can uh, very nicely classify these cells into the correct categories um, using this approach. And, and these, um, uh, what appears to be misclassifications are actually not misclassifications. They represent the heterogeneity within a given population. So for example, stem cells grown in serum are quite heterogeneous, both in terms of their phenotype, but also in terms of their chromatin nanostructure. And we can capture that heterogeneity using this machine learning algorithm. So we're quite excited about this because we think that it can be used potentially to recognize subtle changes in chromatin organization in response to both uh, physiological, but also pathological uh, uh, remodeling events. Um, now I'm going to summarize. I hope I could convince you that super resolution is a powerful method to visualize chromatin um, at high resolution. We showed that um, chromatin nanostructure is quite heterogeneous, uh, but despite that heterogeneity, it's cell type specific and can be manipulated. Um, it's remodeled in disease uh, and in response to degenerative uh, mechanical microenvironments. Um, and we can use machine learning uh, to classify cells based on their chromatin nanostructure. Um, I will thank the people who have done the work. So this has been uh, many years of work um, um, uh, with many trainees involved. Um, and it started as a wonderful collaboration with Pia Cosma's lab at CRG in Spain. Uh, this is when my lab was located in Spain, uh, we collaborated very closely. And the initial work I showed you on uh, you know, nucleosome clutches and clutch domains was done in very close collaboration uh, with Pia Cosma's lab with several trainees working very, very closely in between two labs. Um, the part about um, um, uh, how chromatin nanostructure responds to mechanical environment uh, was the work of uh, Su Chin Hyo at Penn, uh, who now has his own lab at Penn, um, and in very close collaboration with uh, Rob Mauck's lab, uh, also at Penn. Um, uh, very grateful uh, to be back uh, for the really nice model that he has developed uh, that really nicely captures our data, and Jason Burdick for all the really cool hydrogels um, um, that his lab developed. Um, that we got to play with. And uh, Jerome Solon's lab uh, uh, has been helping us uh, develop the machine learning approach. Um, I'm grateful to our funding sources um, and uh, thank you. Uh, and I'm happy to take any questions. 
Thank, thank, thank you so much. I think everybody was fascinated by your talk, so we have quite a few questions. Let's see if we can go okay. to uh, at I'm, least I'm some. I'm going to stop sharing so I can see people. <laughs> okay. Right. Uh, so let, let's see. Uh, how about we start with uh, Anne Sheem from Northwestern? We'd like to ask your question. Sure, thanks. This was a very interesting talk. Um, I was wondering, because you see that most of the chromatin uh, migrates to the border on the soft substrates, of the chromatin that remains in the interior, do you see a change in the domain structure? Do you see that the clutch domains either change in size or you have a different amount, or is it just that they stay the same and they're more spread out? Yeah, so we do see a change um, in their size and the size of these domains. And um, again, I think Vivek is going to tell you more about this um, uh, in terms of how, um, you know, both um, the sort of um, uh, shape changes uh, from like, uh, you know, lamellar to, to circular, as well as how the size changes in response to these changes in levels of methylation and acetylation. But absolutely, um, there are changes in size and shape of these domains. Right. And uh, let's just take a question from uh, Arya uh, Korawar. Would you like to Hi there. Um, just I'm a PhD student at the University of Chicago. I had a question. Um, so regarding extremely interesting results, I, and I, I feel like I have so many questions, but on the stiffening specifically that you see on different substrates, um, it seems like um, high C mapping should be able to capture similar results. But in the experiments that I've seen, you can add the formaldehyde to perform your cross-linking on adherent cells, or you can resuspend the cells before adherence. So you'd expect those would have very different forces acting on the nuclei, acting on the cellular membrane. But mm -hmm. there's actually mm -hmm. very little high difference in the high C maps you get from those two procedures. Mm -hmm. So I guess, how do you think about that in the context of your extremely different storm results? that are showing yeah. this very large reorganization of your chromatin. Yeah, so I mean, we come across this time and again, these differences between high C and imaging data, right? And um, um, it's a good question. So again, we don't have sequence specificity here. We're just looking at uh, genome organization. So it's very possible that domains like TADS remain intact, they don't change. Um, right, um, while the sort of like spatial positioning and organization of the, the genome uh, and its compaction changes. Um, and so it's, it's, it's hard for me without, again, labeling the specific domains. And this is something we're currently working on. So using both, you know, um, um, uh, high C type approaches uh, in conjunction with also, um, 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 uh, oligo paint type approaches where we can at the single cell level paint these domains and see how they relate to um, you know uh, what we are uh, looking at so I think um, it's not difficult for me to envision that um, uh, you know the tads will remain intact uh, but uh, we will still have this uh, uh, physical reorganization within the nucleus that's the best answer I can give right now without really doing more more work. Yeah, thank you very much for that answer. I appreciate it. Thank you. Sure. So we will take a question from uh, Xiaomin Bao and then a question from Son Li. Hi, great talk. So I was really fascinated also by the stiffness experiment. So I was wondering the specific cell types that you use, the human mesenchymal stem cell. What's the physiological stiffness that those cells are used to and what's the stiffness in your in vitro experiment that best recapitulates the native stiffness yeah. that those are expected and yeah. related to that do you see the alteration of chromatin also correlate to gene expression so main my main two questions is one is the ordered stiffness a stress response to the cell because it's not from its native environment? And two, is chromatin disorganization correlated with gene expression? Thank you. So those are fantastic questions. And you know, I ask my collaborators all the time about the physiological stiffness of different tissues, which um, um, I don't remember now off the top of my head. 
but again, these mesenchymal stem cells, uh, people have shown that depending on where they end up um, uh, and the stiffness of the environment can differentiate into different cell types, right? Um, so a more stiff uh, environment will, uh, will lead to differentiation into more like bone-like uh, um, uh, fate, uh, whereas a, a softer substrate will uh, lead to differentiation into a different fate. Um, so definitely the, uh, they adapt to their environment in terms of their um, um, uh, physiological sort of uh, fate when they differentiate. Um, and um, how close are the hydrogels to those environments? Uh, I don't know the answer to that. Um, I don't know what's the stiffness of like bone versus brain um, and whether we are Maliki, I'm covering that. it in my talk. So don't. Uh, yeah. Okay, yeah, so wait, wait for Vivek's talk. <laughs> Thank you, Vivek. <laughs> um, he will save me. Um, so the second question is also a good question. Uh, we expect changes in gene expression because we do see changes in epigenetic marks, increase in silencing marks, but we haven't looked at it yet. We are doing this right now. So we're uh, going to do RNA sequencing um, um, as well as, you know, we started with just looking at few genes. We do see changes in, in, in uh, especially, um, you know, when, when we look at um, um, uh, cell uh, type specific, you know, uh, genes um, that are important uh, for, for cell fate, we do see some changes. Uh, but, you know, um, we don't want to make conclusions by just looking at just a couple of genes. So we're, we're starting to do the RNA sequencing experiments now. Thank you. Thank you. And maybe we can take two uh, last uh, quick uh, questions. Uh, so perhaps one question from uh, Ganesh Pandey and then uh, Drew Stephens will ask the last question. Hi. Oh, uh, wait, sorry. So we, we, we missed the song's question. So, Right, so leave. Good Mr. question. Please, please go ahead. Thank you very much. Uh, great talk. Uh, I just have a question regarding the dynamic change of the stiffness. So, have you tried to uh, uh, do the gel softening and then see whether this process is uh, reversible? Yeah, um, that's a great question. So, I mean, going uh, from soft to stiff, uh, they adapt, right? Uh, from stiff to soft, I don't think we have done those experiments. I don't know that there is a softening gel. Like, can you undo the stiffening? I'm, I don't think you can easily do that technically, um, but we could try growing cells on stiff substrates for a while and then transfer them maybe on a soft substrate to see uh, if they um, uh, the changes are reversible. Definitely going from soft to stiff, right? It's reversible, but uh, going from stiff to soft, we don't know. Right. Uh, and so now I think a question from uh, Ganesh and Drew. Thank you. Uh, my question is, I think, relatively simple. Uh, how, uh, I think earlier you were mentioning that there is some border region where we see the maximum uh, large density. So uh, what is the, the size of typical border of that nucleus? Uh, and like how you generally uh, final decide, okay, this is my border region. Yeah, yeah, so that's a good question. So um, usually what we do is um, um, define it as being, you know, um, I think um, some threshold uh, percentage, like 20 percentage from the, you know, if you just take an intensity profile across the nucleus, the border will appear as like a, a peak um, um, of a given width. Um, and then um, uh, we take it um, uh, from the start of that uh, increase in intensity, like the very outer edge of the nuclear border and 20% in from there. So we define some threshold such that it is the same in, in, in every cell. Thank you. All right, and the, the last question uh, from Drew Stephens. Thank you, uh, this is a great talk. Can you hear me okay? Sorry. Yeah, um, yeah. So very nice data, but how do you reconcile that your data is exactly the opposite of what everyone else is seeing with similar but very different experiments, right? So uh, Vivek and um, Shiva have seen compression causing increase in heterochromatin. Heyo and Mauk have seen uh, stretching increase causes increases in heterochromatin in these mesenchymal stem cells and work with uh, the demon eye 
shows that activation of the plasma membrane mechanically can cause increases in heterochromatin. And there's also experiments in 3D tissues or 3D hydrogels where that elicits a increase in euchromatin or softening of the chromatin. So you're seeing the exact opposite. So how do you reconcile that? Um, exact opposite in terms of... Uh, so no, uh, that's not quite I true. Uh, you know. I, don't, I, don't, I don't think yeah. these... Yeah, I mean, I, I don't think these are comparable. And, you know, I've, I've, we have closely co collaborated with Rob and uh, Suchin and Vivek. Uh, so do I'm going to come to my talk. So just give me, uh, you know, it, it's not <laughs> inconsistent at all. Uh, and some yeah. of the inconsistency comes because of cell type differences. Uh, and also I think the cytoskeleton does play a role and the contractility yes, does. does play a, a role. Um, and it, we can actually play with the contractility and show that it, it, it plays a role. So I don't think the, the data is inconsistent. Um, but yeah. Um, you, you are uh, maybe you're seeing a stiffer substrate it become more euchromatic, correct? It's decompacting. On the, on, on the uh, 30 kilopascal, yes. It, yeah. it, it's less compact, right? So you're challenging with the force and it's becoming less compact. And all of these other papers basically say the opposite. So it's, it's I'm not continuing that your data, but your data is showing something very different. So it'd be really interesting to understand what the difference is because you're getting a, a, a different effect than everyone else is seeing. Um, so if you look at glass, right, which is incredibly stiff, um, so we, we see, again, more heterochromatin there. So it's really between oh, the 3 kilopascal and the 30 kilopascal where there is the difference. Um, That's and, really and, interesting. And, 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 yeah. Um, and so I don't know. Hopefully Vivek can give more insight into why it may be different from previous results. Um, but. Um, and how, how uh, everything uh, sort of like works together. Uh, but we, we, we know that on glass, it, it's, it's very compact as well, right? Which is, that, that's a very stiff substrate. So this might be a, a great topic to talk about when we have the, uh, the panel um, and uh, after uh, Vivek uh, and a couple of more talks. So maybe we can go back uh, to those topics as well. I, and, and I think we, um, we are in a perfect spot right now to transition to the uh, next talk. Uh, will be given by Vivek Shinoy. Vivek Shinoy is the Eduardo Grand President's Distinguished Professor in the School of Engineering and Applied Sciences at the University of Pennsylvania. He is a uh, director of the NSF-funded Science and Technology Center uh, uh, and uh, uh, pretty much established uh, UPenn as the world uh, primary top place to do mechanobiology and put mechanobiology on the map. So personally, when I think about mechano here, mechanobiology, I think UPenn, and this is uh, to a large extent because of the work of uh, Vivek Shinoy. Uh, and uh, I think we're delighted to, uh, to have you with us. Thank you. Yeah, thank thanks. you. Thanks. Uh, thanks. Very much for the invitation, and I'm seeing some sort of okay. All right, uh, yeah. So th 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 thanks for the invitation. Uh, so I'm really uh, glad to hear uh, uh, all the presentations. Uh, you know, the, the very fir the first presentation, and Malik did a great job. So I'm I'm gonna sort of try to put a theoretical spin to some of the things uh, Malik talked about. Drew brought brought up some important questions. There were other questions as well. So. So what I'm going to talk about first is how uh, the stiffness of the microenvironment can affect cytoskeletal organization and, uh, and cytoskeletal organization impacts the morphology of the nucleus, as well as uh, shuttling of the epigenetic factors uh, such as H, HDAX, histone methyl transferases, et cetera. And so that'll be the first part of my talk, uh, which is gonna focus on the cytoskeleton. And after that, uh, you saw this from Malike, and we are going to explain the fact that the organization of uh, chromatin in the interior uh, versus uh, on, the, uh, on the border also, uh, they are called lamin associated domains, how mechanics uh, plays a role into this and, uh, and there are multiple ways mechanics can impact, which 
probably will address uh, Drew's uh, questions. It's not just epigenetics. The cell volume can change, contractility can change, et cetera. And then, uh, and this will be based on a model for uh, phase separation, an active model for phase separation. And after that, I will talk about uh, mechanical uh, properties of chromatin and uh, how the microenvironment can affect the stiffness of uh, chromatin. So that's the, that's the plan. Now, Xiaoming asked about uh, tissue stiffnesses. So here's the slide. Uh, so different tissues have different stiffness. Bone is the stiffest. You know, it's about one gigapascal. We know how bone feels. And muscle is somewhere intermediate. It's about 10 kilopascal. And brain is the softest. Uh, it's one kilopascal. Uh, one kilopascal is like tofu. So if you want to get a sense of what that is, we all know how bone uh, feels like. Now cells, uh, let's say uh, cancer cells, uh, move from really soft environments when they are an epithelial cluster and if they're gonna invade the bone, they're gonna go all the way from maybe the brain through the blood vessel, through the surrounding stroma. So they really see all these different stiffnesses. And depending on the stiffness, they, uh, you know, their organization of the nucleus will also change, which is what uh, I'm gonna uh, focus on. So I wanna start with these experiments uh, from uh, Dennis uh, Disher's lab at Penn, where what he has done is he's taken a mesenchymal uh, stem cell and put it on uh, a glass with an intervening uh, uh, hydrogel here. So when the hydrogel is, uh, is thick, uh, the cell is seeing an effectively stiffer substrate. Whereas if it is thin, it's seeing a stiffer uh, substrate. So the effective stiffness depends on uh, the stiffness as well as the, diff uh, the difference in stiffness of these two. Now, the important thing to see here is that the cell is a lot more spread here and the nucleus is squeezed, okay? So, uh, so clearly uh, the stiffness that the cell sees has an impact on what the nucleus uh, looks like. And as Malika showed, it will also impact chromatin organization, the formation of uh, lamin associated domains and so forth. So of course, there are two things going on here, the shape and the stiffness. So the one, uh, one way to separate this is just uh, culture these cells on, 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 on glass and, uh, and then just pattern the, uh, you know, the, uh, the substrate on which these cells are growing. So you can either have elongated or round cells. And interestingly, if you now look at this elongated cell, uh, the nucleus is no longer round. It looks like a pancake. And that is because you have these additions forming here, which then gives, to the, uh, gives rise to these uh, contractile uh, stress fibers, which squeeze down on the cell. And now, uh, so in these two uh, a different uh, cell, cells of different shape, uh, you see that the amount of histone deacetylase is different. There is more histone deacetylase in the round cells. And uh, uh, similarly, the DNA, uh, DNA, DNA is more condensed in this case. So, so cell geometry, and I'm gonna come to stiffness a little bit later, can give rise to these sorts of uh, changes in DNA organization. There was also a question from Xiaoming, I believe, about gene expression. Yes, absolutely. So when you change the uh, shape of the cell, genes are also uh, expressed uh, in, in different ways. So, uh, so the, here you're looking at the cell size, shape, et cetera. And along the diagonal, there are no changes in the gene expression. You're, you, you know, you're comparing the same shape. But when you, uh, when you look at different shapes, there can be as many as 400 genes that are expressed differently. And, and here there's a list of some of these genes. More contractile genes uh, are, uh, are, are, uh, are upregulated in, 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 uh, in more of the elongated shapes. Uh, and uh, and genes responsible for apoptosis, etc., will be more in the in the round shapes. All right, great. So now, what we want to understand is why. Uh, 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 so how how are these cues from the microenvironment making their way to the nucleus? So I want to do this very uh, qualitatively uh, first, and then maybe I want to go, go into that quantitatively. So if you think of a cell that's sitting on a say an elongated uh, uh, on an elongated substrate, then uh, the cells are sensing forces, and because the shape is anisotropic, uh, and if you start off with an isotropic force because of the actomycin activity within the cell, because of the shape you get anisotropy, and that anisotropy in turn will lead to formation of these focal adhesions because focal adhesions are stabilized by mechanical force. So, so at the ends of these cells, you get uh, increased focal adhesions. 
which then feed back on uh, on the acto uh, uh, myosin system and that will stabilize the acto myosin system it will also then feed back to the nucleus there is a further stiffening of the nuclear envelope and uh, uh, you know and then you get this uh, deformation of the nucleus so it's this feedback between focal adhesion stress fibers and the nucleus we want to model so again i don't have time to go into the details here and this feedback occurs uh, because of the, because of signaling pathways uh, for instance in response to force here there are pathways like the raw rock or calcium that can cause further uh, increase in contractility so uh, so uh, uh, if you look at these references over the years we built this model for three dimensional contractility within the cell so uh, so uh, very qualitatively contractility is basically a dipole you know a, a myosin motor is uh, basically grabbing onto actin and pulling as i've shown here and a three dimensional distribution is captured by the contractility tensor so without going into the details i want to show this feedback at work so here uh, you have uh, two cells of the same volume to start with same area but the shape is different now here there is this is more anisotropic here the stress is more uniformly distributed so here you get this polarized uh, 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 organization of actomyosin here it is more isotropic and more force are generated here because of that feedback uh, through signaling that i talked about and as a consequence simply by uh, changing the cell shape you can uh, uh, give rise to different uh, 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 morphologies of the nucleus in general elongated cells will have a lot more uh, uh, deformed uh, nucleus more like a pancake all right great now the question is how uh, how, uh, the, uh, how how does this affect the other processes such as uh, such as, such as uh, transcription gene expression and uh, organization of the nucleus so here i'm going to focus on two things hdac and mkl now mkl has substrates on uh, g actin and when g actin polymerizes to m uh, uh, to f actin because of the uh, substrate stiffness then the mkl can shuttle into the nucleus and cause transcription so that's one of the ways in which uh, gene expression is impacted uh, by uh, by uh, by chromatin organization the other way is that uh, hdac actually shuttles uh, does the opposite it shuttles from the nucleus uh, to uh, to cytoplasm because it's believed it's 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 not been proven conclusively but a lot of the data that i'm going to show is going to uh, 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 prove the point that hdac may have a substrates on f actin all right so now very briefly uh, uh, we know what the contractility is we can write down these sort of rare equations and then uh, some of the shuttling uh, 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 coefficients the kinetic kinetic coefficients depend on contractility so what we can do is we can take cells of uh, different area uh, different shape and then fit our model so the so the blue are the training of our model and then it actually predicts uh the uh you know it, it nicely predicts uh what what other shapes uh, and uh, uh sizes will give you both for f actin and hdac against the opposite uh, for the reasons that i explained all right great now uh, to further validate the model uh, what we did is we took the cell and then applied a force on the cell meaning uh, we pushed it down by a force this typically is the force that a cell will feel in a micro environment so now you see that when you apply a compressive force uh, you know the actomyosin is organized by tension compression will disorganize actomyosin that's exactly that we uh, what we see experimentally and now if you go back and look at the hdac the uh, in the in the cell that is compressed hdac goes uh, goes uh, into the nucleus okay and the nucleus is now uh, more condensed so here there are no fitting parameters whatsoever we took our previous model and now you see more uh, more uh, condensed uh, dna uh, in here so uh, so next what i want to talk about is how is chromatin organized i talked about these epigenetic fact epigenetic factors and so forth so the qu next question is how is uh, the dna organized so sort of uh, uh, trying to address some of the questions that uh, Uh, that they were brought up in uh, uh, after Melike's talk and to explain her observations. So here I just want to go back to the experiments uh, we did with uh, with Shiva, and 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 so here uh, there was also a question of whether this thing is uh, uh, reversible. It absolutely is. 
So if you uh, if you apply a force, uh, you know, and then and then uh, so this is control. Here is the case where you applied a load, and then if you remove it, it's fully reversible, meaning the chromatin will condense and and decondense. And now let's look more carefully at the epigenetic uh, status of, of of these cells. So first, I'm going to look at the H3K27 uh, methylation. Uh, with load, it, it actually increases more at the periphery, right? Uh, in the interior, it's the same. Now, when you look at K9 methylation, uh, then that also increases uh, with, uh, with load. And, uh, and you see that it is, uh, uh, it, it's co-localized with DNA. So clearly, you're forming, uh, you know, these... Uh, these heterochromatic uh, domains here, uh, whereas acetylation is the opposite. And acetylation is uh, it, 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 it's anti-correlated with this uh, condensed DNA. So it's clearly uh, 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 marking uh, euchromatin. All right, great. So here I'm going to be very brief. So these, this data is fully consistent, uh, Drew, with what, uh, what Melike uh, presented. So, uh, so on uh, uh, right, it, it, you keep increasing stiffness. The thickness of the hetero, uh, of this uh, lamin layers will uh, will will grow up, as well as the uh, the size of these domains uh, will uh, will go up. All right. So next, I want to try to uh, uh, model this and explain why this is going on from a uh, from a physical uh, point of view. Now, when you're changing substrate stiffness, you're changing actomy actomycin activity, and actomycin activity is leading to shuttling of these epigenetic factors, as well as changing the cell volume. I'll come to that later. Uh, uh, so, uh, so, so uh, uh, as a consequence, uh, this uh, you're getting more methylation in uh, in the case of uh, softer substrates or substrates on which you have applied a compressive uh, force. And, uh, uh, and so the question is, how do we model this? So, uh, so clearly, methylation and acetylation uh, re reactions convert uh, euchromatin uh, to heterochromatin, uh, which is very well known. So we are going to uh, uh, adopt a phase field approach. So the idea of this approach is that uh, it's, a it's a continuum approach. We're not going to worry about uh, sequence specificity and things like that. At any point in space, we say that there's a certain fraction of euchromatin, a certain fraction of nucleoplasm, and the remaining uh, is heterochromatin. So that's going to be the approach. And we are going to account for chromatin-chromatin interactions, chromatin-lamin interactions, and methylation and acetylation. So, so I just want to uh, briefly talk about phase separation here. So if you think about, again, so uh, here there are two variables, the uh, nucleoplasm and chromatin. I'm going to simplify this for the sake of presentation. So if you just think about a C being the amount of heterochromatin, then if you have an energy landscape uh, like this, which can arise because of uh, in a number of reasons, uh, the sort of the uh, uh, co competition between entropy and enthalpy and so forth, the standard kind of approach. Then uh, if you are at a, 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 at a volume fraction like this, it'll phase separate into these two phases. And uh, and here it is spinodally unstable, so it's gonna it's gonna decompose like this, and in time it's gonna coarsen, and you're gonna get a one big uh, droplet of heterochromatin. So how do we do that mathematically? You can write a free energy that has the interfacial energy uh, of these interfaces, uh, something that captures this double well landscape, and then standard uh, sort of approach from thermodynamics, write a chemical potential, and then you can uh, look at the evolution. So that is what uh, you will get. Uh, but this is not what is seen. You get these very stable droplets, right? So, so, so you're not getting Ostwald ripening, as was also discussed uh, in the very first uh, talk today. So why is that? The reason is that to this, you also have to add the methylation and acetylation uh, reactions. So C is the, uh, is, uh, the amount of uh, heterochromatin. So a methylation will increase heterochromatin, acetylation will decrease this. And interestingly, now, once you put those reactions in and, and increase the level of acetylation, you basically get very stable domains uh, that are uh, stable, meaning it's stable against coarsening. So you get a, uh, you get a, a, a characteristic size. And, uh, and depending on the level of acetylation, you can either get lamellar domains that are stable against coarsening or more of these uh, uh, spherical domains, if you will, uh, that are stable against coarsening. Now, why is that? Uh, very, very simple. So uh, if you had a random distribution like this and you ask what's gonna happen to this, 
then if you look at the rate of change of each of the uh, of the size uh, of these domains here there is a competition uh, between the free energy and the interfacial energy and this is very standard stuff uh, in physics or material science where you get a critical radius beyond which all of these uh, domains will grow and to minimize interfacial energy the best thing you can do is just uh, coarsen and get uh, one uh, 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 one single droplet. So the important point here is that beyond this radius, all of the domains can grow depending on what the chemical potential is. But now if you introduce a chemical reaction, what is gonna happen is, uh, uh, you know, this heterochromatic domain is not quite stable. It actually wants to come apart uh, because of this uh, fact that the optimum, uh, uh, you know, density given by this equation is neither heterochromatic nor euchromatic. So as a re reason, what's gonna happen is that this, growth rate uh, will uh, will become zero here. And unlike this unstable fixed point, you get a stable fixed point. And that actually is the size, that actually decides the size of these, uh, of these heterochromatic domains. And now we can compare what you see in soft and stiff. Uh, clearly, uh, again, I, I won't have time to go into the details. You can also do some analytical analysis and relate the cluster size to the methylation rate and acetylation uh, rates. Uh, and it turns out uh, that on stiff substrate where, uh, where methylation levels are low or acetylation levels are high, you get these smaller domains and on, uh, uh, and, and on soft, you get these bigger domains. Exactly what Malike sees and, and completely consistent with what you have seen with uh, Shiva uh, and work done by others as well. All right, now what about the uh, formation of uh, uh, the, uh, the domains associated with the nuclear lamina? So here, what we did is we introduced a potential of interaction with the nuclear lamina makes perfect sense. I mean, it's believed that there are some molecules that can tether uh, 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 the uh, chromatin to the nuclear lamina. So we assume a, a, a sort of dependence like this with, uh, uh, with the distance and uh, assume that it's uh, proportional to the, <coughs> sorry, de density C. And with this, now you can you actually see the formation of these uh, you know these uh, lamin associated uh, the, the, the associated domains. Here the interactions are here. It is periodic in this direction, so you see those that sort of thing. And now if you keep increasing the affinity, uh, meaning uh, make this more attractive, then what you're going to see here is a classic phenomena not known in physics and material science as wetting. So here you get a droplet that makes a 90 degree contact angle, which is kind of in the non-wetting regime. And as you make the affinity larger, you start getting wetting and then completely, you get complete wetting here, okay? Now, uh, if you read the classic papers on wetting, that, is, that also wants to minimize interfacial energy. So if, if the system wets, you get a, a very big, uh, an infinitely uh, thick layer, but here you don't. The reason is acetylation and methylation comes in. And we can, if you, if you increase uh, methylation, you're going to increase the size of uh, uh, the lad domains. You're also going to increase uh, the, the size of your heterochromatic domain. So here, it is an interplay of three things, chromatin, chromatin interaction, chromatin lamin interaction, and methylation acetylation. So really this, uh, you know, this interconversion is a really important piece of, of, of this story, okay? So, uh, uh, so Malike showed you this, uh, this data, uh, you know, we can uh, compare uh, sort of the, you know, size of these little dots here to these. Uh, we can compare the, you know, the net amount of heterochromatin versus euchromatin on the border versus the interior. All of this nicely works out. And the important point that I want to make here is that stiff substrate that is decreased HDAC, at least uh, the, the you know, from our data, that's what it suggests. There may be other epigenetic regulators we do not know about. What we have looked at is HDAC. And that leads to uh, increased acetylation or decreased methylation, uh, which in turn uh, gives you uh, this, these uh, differences in morphologies. So now what you can do is you can just focus on the soft, uh, the cell on the soft substrate and treat it with GSK. So G GSK inhibits methylation. So it sort of becomes uh, closer to what you're doing on stiff uh, and you get uh, uh, more euchromatin and also, uh, you know, these lamin associated domains uh, disappear. So, uh, so this sort of explains a lot of, uh, uh, you know, uh, the data that Malik has showed as well as the previous work uh, we have done with Shivashankar's lab. 
Now I know that in your center, there's a huge focus on, uh, on transcription. So again, I, I won't have time to go into the details here. I just want to show that when you actually compress the cell, it is as if you're taking a, a, a soaked piece of sponge and squeeze it. So water will move out, right? Water will get out. So, so in other words, in a reversible manner, you can actually change the volume of the nucleus, right? And why is the volume changing? Because of the fact that water is leaving. So, so it turns out that uh, if you change the amount of water, then you will get more heterochromatin. You get, uh, uh, you know, uh, you, you get uh, patterns like this when uh, compared to when there's uh, less water, and that's fully consistent. When you apply load, there is much more condensation. And I won't have time to go into this. And this clearly also has implications for transcription and, and gene expression. So since Drew is here, and I actually sent him an email uh, this morning, uh, I just told him I'm going to uh, discuss some of his data. So, so in everything that uh, we have discussed, I didn't talk about the mechanics of chromatin itself. I just assume that it's a two-phase, uh, you know, it's a, it's a phase separation phenomenon. But we do know that chromatin is, is viscoelastic, right? And this is nice paper, very recent paper that actually uh, through, uh, uh, through FRET has shown that uh, you know, if, you, uh, if you bleach a part of heterochromatin or euchromatin, it won't recover because chromatin behaves like a solid. There's other data uh, that actually has done elastography on chromatin that actually shows that heterochromatin is about uh, five to 10 times uh, stiffer than euchromatin. It makes perfect sense, it's more dense. And there's a beautiful work uh, from Drew that actually shows that if you add Mg2+, leading to more condensation, uh, the, uh, the, the stiffness uh, of, of, of the whole nucleus uh, will go up. So here it is lamin dominated, here it is uh, dominated by heterochromatin. So, so, uh, so what we wanna do is we wanna bring, uh, uh, bring mechanics into phase separation, uh, which uh, as far as I know, uh, with this non-equilibrium phenomena has not been done. So, so the idea is we follow the same approach. We have this energy of mixing interfacial energy and overall the material is incompressible, meaning any change in volume has got to do with the water coming in and out. And to this, it, it's a very, uh, you know, the deformations are large. So we use nonlinear elasticity as well as, uh, 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 you know, uh, apply uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, viscoelastic damping. And now uh, the important thing is, uh, you know, so uh, if you think about heterochromatin versus euchromatin, euchromatin has more water in it, heterochromatin is less water. So clearly there is incompatibility. One wants to swell, uh, you know, to a certain extent, the other wants to swell more. So here, what I'm plotting is the Mises stress, which gives you an idea of the shear stress. And uh, so when, when this phase separation occurs, uh, so where you see blue is either heterochromatin or here you have euchromatin, okay? So, so it turns out that, uh, uh, that, that, that uh, uh, it, the shear stress that, uh, that will be, uh, uh, that, that, that'll, that, that'll occur everywhere. And so it then makes sense that if you increase the shear modulus, your phase separation should be suppressed. Okay, so there isn't uh, direct experimental evidence for this, at least, uh, you know, so this is a prediction, at least that I know. But I think there is indirect evidence, which I'm going to uh, touch upon in the next few slides uh, before I, I finish. And this is something we are really interested in collaborating uh, with. Uh, uh, you know, folks here, because you can change the stiffness by using HP1 alpha by, you know, by a number of different uh, means, uh, right? And this clearly brings in uh, uh, this impact of mechanics on, on phase uh, physics, as well as chromatin organization, epigenetics, et cetera. It's a different aspect. I talked about HDAC, I talked about volume, and this is a third way in which uh, things can affect. Uh, all right, so this is Drew's uh, data from a, uh, from a couple of years ago. So you see that uh, uh, when you put in uh, uh, magnesium, that which will, which will increase compaction, the stiffness uh, goes up. And uh, there are these two regulators which lead to, more, uh, to reduced compaction. Uh, one, I believe, is an HDAC inhibitor and the other uh, inhibits uh, methylation. And, and in all these cases, less compact, uh, less stiff, more compact, more stiff. There's also some uh, nice data from Megan King's lab that's on the archive that uh, wild type, uh, if this is the stiffness. So again, I'm not familiar with these because these are, uh, uh, you know, these are regulators in yeast 
but uh, uh, but h uh, this uh, swai 6 delta is equal to hp1 and uh, you know these two things affect uh, uh, acetylation and methylation so again the similar very similar results so now what we can do is we can take this uh, uh, this model that we have and uh, impose a strain on it and see what the stiffness is right so the stiffness you see is uh, in, in this range, which is similar to the range of the uh, or physiological stiffness of the ECM uh, uh, outside, a, a bit on the higher side. Uh, now, uh, when, you, uh, when you increase methylation or reduce acetylation, you're going to get more heterochromatin, and this is stiffer. Uh, this is softer, right? So here we are uh, simply changing methylation and acetylation. In other words, we are changing the net volume fraction of this. Makes, uh, makes total sense. Now, uh, uh, Drew also has a paper up on the archive uh, where uh, with the auxin, you can change the amount of HP1 alpha. So this I believe does not really change chromatin organization. Uh, in other words, it has roughly the same amount of U and hetero. It's just that the hetero is stiffer, right? And in this case, uh, uh, you know, the, the when you, when, when you, treat with the auxin that is degrade HP1 alpha, the, the nucleus becomes softer. Again, we can do this in our simulations pretty easily because uh, we have a phase separated system. And all that we do is go to heterochromatin and assign it a different stiffness. And if you see here, it's fully consistent with what Drew has seen, uh, right? Uh, so I, I really wanna emphasize that we are not starting with any given configuration. You start with, it's a kind of random system, it phase separates. It picks these morphologies by itself, and then after that, we can, uh, you know, we can use our simulations to extract uh, uh, the, the, the 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 stiffness. All right, great. So to uh, so to finish, what I showed you is that uh, cells actually, uh, you know, sense their microenvironment, and then that affects the adhesions, which then affects the phosphorylation of myosin motors and formation of stress fibers which then leads to shuttling of HDAC as well as changing um, nuclear mechanics. And this in turn affects the organization of uh, chromatin uh, as, well as, uh, uh, as well as gene expression and the mechanics, right? So that's what I showed you. Now, the other work that we are involved in is when these changes occur, how, uh, right? Uh, are they fully reversible or are they, are they not? I think uh, Song asked that question. So it really depends on how long you expose that cell to a certain level of stiffness. If you expose it to a certain level of stiffness for a few hours, the cells will forget it. But if the exposure is long, the cell can, rem uh, you know, the, it can, the cell can remember it. And this is called mechanical memory. So all of these things feed back. Unfortunately, I don't have time to uh, talk about the mechanical memory. And I see that my clock is at uh, 30 minutes. So I'll stop there. Uh, Vivek, thank you so much. So what we will do is we will not take any questions right now. I see there are some uh, quite a few questions in the chat room because we will have uh, time uh, during the uh, uh, panel and that's when uh, we'll ask those those questions. So the uh, so let's go ahead with the you know th thank you so much. Let's give a virtual applause to uh, Vivek. Fascinating, fascinating stuff. It's really whenever I listen to your talks, I I feel like I. I'm witnessing history in the making, right? <laughs> um, the, the future of genomics uh, and the kind of biology. So uh, virtual applause, please. I see a few hands, okay. Uh, we need to practice with the virtual applause better. Okay, here's my hand. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, all right, so now, uh, we have uh, more fascinating talks to come. And I think it's a perfect time to introduce uh, our next speaker, Andy uh, Spakowitz from uh, Stanford uh, University. And uh, so here at the uh, physical, uh, Central Physical Genomics at Northwestern, we, uh, we're trying to bring in, uh, foster more convergence and bring in more uh, people who can do collaborative research or interdisciplinary research across different fields, and um, uh, and uh, uh, and this research really epitomizes uh, what convergence really is. If you if you name the field, uh, 
which spans biology and physics and computational sciences and has got it. So it's, I think, you know, he has had a fascinating career of bridging computational physics, uh, fundamental physics, biophysics, uh, molecular biology again, uh, working on dynamics uh, of uh, molecular, uh, molecular dynamics, macromolecular dynamics, uh, protein self-assembly, polymer physics. Um, I think when Andy gives his talk in, uh, in front of polymer physicists, they, they get all excited because it's a great polymer physics. And when he gives talks uh, in biological community, there's a lot of excitement as well. So uh, thank, thank Andy, thank you for, for being here and thank you for showing what convergence actually is. And without further ado, uh, Andy, it's all yours. And I think you're muted too. Uh, so thank you very much for the invitation and for the very generous uh, introduction. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share screen. Let me get this worked out. All right, can you see? Can you see my slide? And okay, perfect. And it's full screen. Okay. Um, so so first of all, um, you know, based on. Uh, Based on the lineup of speakers, which which are just absolutely excellent, uh, and the topics that they explored, I actually did a little bit of modification of what it is that I'm going to talk about today. Um, so what I am going to talk about is is a very important biological process that involves you know large scale chromosomal organiz uh, reorganization and dynamics. Okay, and that is uh, the process of homolog pairing during uh, prophase one of meiosis, okay? Um, but it turns out that um, the topic that I had originally said I was gonna talk about was active biological fluctuations and how they can impact the dynamics of, of, you know, of chromosomes. And, um, oh, sorry, accidentally did that. Um, but you know, but I am I am going to touch on that because, in fact, um, the issues that I was you know originally going to talk about uh, play a huge role in this uh, in in uh, homolog pairing, but it also plays a really important role in a lot of biological processes. Okay, so very briefly, um, I'm I'm actually an engineer by training, um, and my my work has really been in soft materials physics, uh, but it turns out that all living things are made of soft, squishy things. And so um, it, it is at least my opinion that uh, the lens of, um, of soft materials physics is a useful uh, lens for interrogating uh, and explaining what is observed in living systems. Okay, and so you know, while a lot of my research is focused on on biological processes, we're also interested in other synthetic polymers. And I actually, to be honest with you, I I think that these are all soft materials problems, uh, at least from my perspective. Okay, so um, so let's dive right in. And what I'm going to talk about today is is the fundamental. Um, processes uh, associated with, with the making of gametes, of sperm cells and egg cells. Uh, and this is extremely, you know, of course, this is extremely important for all organisms that engage in sexual reproduction. Okay. And so, so the basics is, is that, you know, of course, sexual reproduction is, you know, leads to enhanced variation and adaptability of the offspring. Okay. And um, that greater, you know, diversity uh, you know, of course, is is going to be essential. Uh, you know, you, you know, from from many, you know, um, uh, over over a long period of time, evolution takes place because of this uh, diversity that arises from sexual reproduction. However, um, there are issues with um, sexual reproduction in that. Um, errors in the formation of the gametes can lead to chromosomal abnormalities. So um, non-disjuncture uh, can occur where, where in, you know, in some instances you get uh, more chromosomes than uh, in, in the daughter cells than you would otherwise would, would like to have, in the gametes than the, you would like to have. And, and that can lead to uh, various syndromes, including Down syndrome and Klinefelter's. Okay. So the question is, is what's going on you know, in the process of forming these gametes. Okay, so let me walk you through very briefly the biology. 
Um, the, the formation of an egg cell or a sperm cell occurs through two rounds of, of cell division. Okay, and in the first, uh, in the first place, you start uh, with a haploid cell uh, that uh, undergoes DNA replication. Okay, so you have, um, so then you have two uh, pairs of homologous chromosomes. And what happens is, is that during meiosis one, there is a pairing of those homologous chromosomes. There is crossover events where genetic information is, is actually transferred uh, between these, these chromosomes leading to, um, uh, and then upon cell division, you actually wind up having two uh, diploid cells that are going to uh, have these, the, this exchange of the genetic information. And that actually is at the heart of the variability that arises in the offspring. Okay, and then in the next round of meiosis, in, in this second uh, stage of cell division, uh, you split uh, these diploid cells into two haploid cells. And so the whole process, this two-step process, leads to four uh, haploid cells uh, 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 coming out from an original haploid cell uh, through these two rounds of cell division, replication and cell division. Okay, but the question that we really wanna tackle here is, is just to focus on this, this stage right here during meiosis one. Prophase one of meiosis one is, is the period when um, those homologous pairs are actually gonna come together and exchange their genetic information. And so what we wanna understand is what is the dynamics of that process and, and how can we uh, think about this using you know, sort of fundamental understanding of polymer physics for how these chromosomes in this confined environment can move around and find each other. Okay. And so um, let's, let's focus now a little bit more on prophase one. Um, what you get is that uh, early on, uh, the two homologous chromosomes are actually in what's called the rabble configuration, where the centromeres, and by the way, this is in uh, cerevisiae, this is in yeast. Um, so, um, uh, you know, there's differences between this case and, and other organisms, but I'm going to focus on cerevisiae because that's the experiments that we are, um, that we're working with. Okay. So, um, so it's in this rabble configuration where the centromeres are uh, attached to the nuclear envelope, as are the telomeres of the two homologous chromosomes. And then at some point, uh, and it appears to be somewhat stochastic, the centromere is released, and then the chromosomes are allowed to move around. And you know, sort of simultaneous to that, you have uh, these double strand breaks that are introduced into these chromosomes, which then have these ganglions that can form together and then uh, repaired. And that's the crossover events that takes place where the genetic information is then swapped. Okay. But um, the, the point is, is that this is all happening in a very stochastic manner. Um, there's events that take place in one cell that occur at a different time than another. And so to sort of wrap our heads around this, we really have to think about the stochasticity of the problem and to think about how we can reconcile that against our basic fundamental understanding of, of the physical behavior of chromosomes. Okay. And so... Um, just to highlight this, let's let's sort of think about the stochasticity in the following way: is that if you look at the the progression of time after the induction of meiosis in in these um, experiments that I'm going to describe by uh, that were performed in Sean Burgess's lab at UC Davis, um, the time is after they put it, these cells into a sporulation media, which induces uh, meiosis to occur. Uh, what you have is that you first start from a rabble configuration and stochastically in the population, it releases those centromeres. They're now you know, free to fluctuate around and then double strand breaks are introduced and they start to form these linkages. Then eventually they either, and I don't want to say zipper up because that has you know, a very specific you know, uh, you know, uh, picture that arises in your head. Um, but nonetheless, they come together in a stochastic manner to eventually form what appears to be on the order of, say, between three to seven crossover events um, when you look at, at the population. But again, it's stochastic, and where the crossover events occur is also appears to be quite stochastic, though there's some variability and there are hot spots, which, which I'm not going to talk about today. Okay, so, um, so the experiments which were again performed uh, in Sean Burgess's lab by a very talented postdoc named Trent Newman, um, is, is the following. They, uh, they fluorescently labeled loci 
uh, on the homologous chromosomes so that they could track their dynamics in, in space and time and, and also how they move relative to each other. And that's the question is, is given that you only are able to observe these individual bright spots fluctuating around, what can we infer about the dynamics of the, of the underlying chromosomes? And, and can we rationalize that based on all of these really complex you know, biological events that are taking place beneath the scenes, including the, the release of the centromeres, the pairing of the chromosomes and, and all the dynamics that takes place. Okay, and so that's really what we're gonna be thinking about. All right, so um, the, the, what we have done in the past is, you know, the, the, let me, let me point, point out, I'll, I'll go back to the previous slide. And so here, this is a, a chymograph uh, of the distance between the, uh, these loci as a function of time. And you can see that in some instances, they sort of pair and come apart and pair and come apart. Sometimes they're always paired. Sometimes they remain unpaired the entire time. But, um, and so there's a lot of heterogeneity here. But what you also notice is that the time axis is really long, right? Like, like you know, this is, this is something that takes... Uh, these are events that are taking place on, you know, minutes to, to hours even. And for us to model this and to use some fundamental physical insight, we need to have a model that can reconcile these time scales. Okay. And so what we found in the past is that, you know, um, using, ex you know, an extremely simple picture of polymer chains as essentially, you know, um, uh, beads and springs that are fluctuating around due to thermal motion, uh, and then also subjected to the viscoelastic drag of the environment, that this is a very useful framework for us to analyze the dynamics, okay? Uh, and it actually is amenable to doing, you know, full, you know, sort of pencil and paper theory uh, to get these, uh, these results. And the only point of doing that is, is that, um, these timescales are just so long that if you try to do this using any detailed simulation, it's, it's really quite difficult to access these sorts of time scales. Okay. So, um, and, and work that I've done in the past with Julie Terrio in a variety of settings um, has been really valuable um, in building this sort of picture. Okay. So here's the thing is, so let's look at the experimental results. And now what I'm actually plotting here is what we call the mean uh, square change of displacement. So what it is, is you're taking the vector difference between the two loci that, you're, that are fluorescently labeled, okay? And you're looking at the diffusion of that vector, okay? So in other words, it's like the relative diffusion of one locus relative to another. And so what is, so this is a way of looking at the, the sort of trajectory dynamics of the two chromosomes relative to one another inside of these cells. Okay, so for wild type cells at, at five hours after um, sporulation, after it goes into uh, meiosis, um, what you see is you see a ton of heterogeneity. Generally speaking, the, the MSCD shows a plateau or maybe just a little bit of, of a subdiffusive behavior, a power law, which is very shallow, but then it plateaus, okay? But the plateau level is extremely diverse, okay? Now, there's a set of mutants, uh, the SPO11 mutants. And so just to be clear, SPO11 is the protein that is inducing these double strand breaks that lead to the pairing. So what you can think of is that um, the wild type has pairing, the SPO11 mutants, you know, do not have pairing between the chromosomes. And so that's sort of the difference. And what you see is that um, they're both highly heterogeneous, um, but you, you also see that perhaps the SPO11 has a higher level of the plateau relative to that of the wild type, okay? But what I, the point of this slide is just to say that the dynamics are really complex and it's very difficult to tease out exactly what's going on when you have this population where so many things are going on, including centromere release and uh, the pairing of these chromosomes at randomly located uh, locations along the genomes. Okay. Whoops. Okay. So here's what we did is we take this very simple polymer model it's a flexible polymer in a viscoelastic environment. And we say, well, what if we just randomly place linkages between them? So now we're looking at two polymers that are linked together 
at random locations. And um, what we do is, so this is, this is the sort of the same, you know, physical properties, length and mechanics and location of the uh, tag loci as the Euro three locus, which is one of the ones that were tracked. Okay. And what happens is, is that uh, you indeed see this high heterogeneity in the plateau. You see a, you know, sort of a subdiffusive behavior of the individual trajectories followed by a plateau, which is highly heterogeneous. Okay. So the basic picture there is, is, um, is, you know, sort of consistent with what the experiments are. Okay. Now this is on a single cell basis. So the question is, is, well, what happens if we look at the population? Okay, so now the problem is, is that, you know, we have all this single cell data, we want to interpret it in terms of these heterogeneous events that are happening at the molecular scale. And what we want to do is we want to understand uh, this relative to a model, which includes the random linkages between the chromosomes, as well as the release of the centromere from the nuclear envelope. Okay. And so without going into um, all of the details of how we capture the physics of the, rab the, the rabble configuration and the confinement of the nucleus, suffice it to say that when we put in all the relevant parameters, okay, what we see is that the, uh, the dots, which are the experiments at various times throughout meiosis, and the lines are the theory, which is now averaged over all possible linkage configurations and all possible release in the uh, centromeres from the nuclear envelope. Okay. And what we see is that um, for the wild type, you see this non this, this non-monotonic behavior where the plateau levels and the dynamics go up through meiosis, but then it comes back down from T3 to T5. Ostensibly, the going up is because of the centromere release, and the going back down is because of the subsequent pairing of the, uh, of the chromosomes, okay? And we can do this both for the Euro 3 locus as well as the LICE 2 locus, and we see you know, very good agreement between the experiments and the theory. Now, one caveat that I do have to say, and this is where I'm gonna get into this active dynamics, um, uh, is that the, uh, the diffusivity, the effective diffusivity actually is changing throughout the course of meiosis, okay? And I'm gonna show you that in just a second. Um, so we actually do fit the diffusivity at each one of these different times, okay? And I'll show you what those fit parameters are, but actually it's well known or it's, it's been established that during meiosis, uh, there's a phenomenon called rapid telomere motion where the telomeres are actually um, undergoing rapid motion around the nuclear envelope adding this active force, which is in, ostensibly sort of jiggling around and moving these chromosomes around much more rapidly than they would be if they were just, you know, in, in S phase or in, in a normal um, conditions. Okay, so, um, so here's the thing. And, and so here's this diffusion coefficient or technically it's a subdiffusion coefficient. I can explain why in the question and answer period if, if you'd like. Um, but what happens is, is that during, throughout the, the um, uh, chronological stage, okay, so after sporulation, okay, the Euro 3 locus appears to ramp up in its diffusivity, and then it appears to kind of plateau. Just for the record, these two points here and here, I don't have, you know, we don't have a, a clear uh, understanding of why the SPO11 mutant exhibits these, these two points at the later stage, but um, a lot, you know, a lot of these are then actually undergoing the transition through meiosis. So at these late stage, um, it's, it's not clear whether or not we're, we're still dealing with the same, you know, the same behavior at this point. But anyways, what we do see is a ramping up of the diffusivity. And there's a more pronounced ramping up of the Euro 3 locus versus the LICE 2. And just for the record, Euro 3 is much, much closer to the telomeres than LICE 2, which is more centrally located on, on the chromosome. On, on its chromosome, I, I believe it's uh, chromosome five. Um, so anyways, this is, this is what's happening, um, is that there's an accelerated motion. Oh, Vadim, just, just quickly, how much time do I have left? Uh, so we're a little, uh, little behind uh, the schedule. Um, so we're supposed to have a 
panel uh, starting seven minutes ago, but yeah, <laughs> but that's okay. We, okay. okay. Go, go let me. Ahead. Okay, perfect. Yes. So let me let me get into the point of this active dynamics, and then I'll 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 drop the last part. Okay. So here's the thing: is that um, it's clear that you know um, it, or, or at least what our theory in in relation to the experiments is suggesting is that there's these dramatic dynamics which are changing throughout the course of meiosis. Now, of course, we haven't established that it plays any important functional role in, in homolog pairing. That's, that's something that we will proceed to, to try to analyze down the road. But nonetheless, there's an acceleration in the dynamics. Okay, so let me, let me just, so let's, let's talk about this um, from the following context. Okay, so some eight years ago, um, Julie Terrio and, and I and her, her graduate student, Steph Weber, who's now faculty at, at McGill. Um, Steph did these great experiments where what she did was she looked at particle motion in Cerevisiae. Um, and what she did was she looked at, these were RNA protein particles that were, you know, fluorescently labeled and she could track them in time. And she actually looked at what is the apparent diffusivity versus the actual temperature, okay? And she did this, you know, roughly between, you know, sort of four degrees and, and you know, maybe, you know, 50 degrees thereabouts. But, but um, there was this, and then what she did was she looked at those dynamics in untreated cells, and those are the ones in red, versus cells that were, you know, uh, subjected to azide and deoxyglucose. So, so no ATP hydrolysis. And something very different occurred is that you see that the temperature dependence of these two diffusivities is fundamentally different. Is in the case of dead cells where there's no ATP or very little ATP, um, the diffusivity does not change very much over that temperature range. And it looks roughly linear. I mean, if you extrapolate this down to zero, it roughly looks like what you would predict from a Stokes-Einstein type um, uh, uh, relationship. However, the untreated cells have this massive acceleration in the diffusivity, okay? And in fact, it's better captured by an Arrhenius expression, which would be indicative of um, there being active biological forces that were dictated by enzymatic activity. Okay, so that was our interpretation at the time. Okay. But the thing that, we, that I want to just leave you with today is, this pro is the following problem. And okay, so here's some... Terrible math, but let me just explain what this is. Okay, so um, what we did was we developed a, uh, a path integral formulation of active Brownian motion, where we have both Brownian uh, fluctuations as well as active fluctuations. And active fluctuations, we assume, are going to have a certain level of processivity and a time scale of correlation to them. Okay, now what happens though is that um, when you look at the, this, what's called the active Brownian kernel, which dictates the role of those fluctuations, okay? That you get a very interesting form where you have a Brownian piece and then you have an active piece. So if you look at the frequency dependence of this kernel, you get these two contributions. And the form of, form of this actually suggests that active forces are almost behaving like an effective temperature but that effective temperature depends on time. And so in other words, if you are undergoing very fast dynamics at very small length scales, your, uh, your physics is oblivious to the fact that there's active forces. However, if you're looking at very large uh, time scale and length scale dynamics, your behavior is strongly influenced. So in other words, the length scale is going to dictate what is the effective fluctuation spectrum that you feel because of the competition between the time scale of active forces and your own time scale of relaxation. And so what is the consequence of this? Is that in a nutshell, if you look at the dynamics, so here I'm showing the mean squared, this MSCD for an active Brownian polymer, is that if you look at separations that are very, very short, they're totally oblivious to the active forces. Whereas if you go to very, very long genomic length scales along these chromosomes, you see an accelerated fluctuation. And so what we, what we infer from this is that the way to think about these active forces is very much dependent upon the length scale of processes you're interested in. 
Local biological processes may be totally oblivious to active forces, whereas the large scale processes like chromosomal um, reorganization and homolog pairing, those are very strongly influenced by active forces. And we're proceeding to analyze this now. Okay, so I'm gonna, I'm actually gonna pause. I'm gonna, I'm gonna conclude here. I actually, we've, we've looked at dwell time distributions for these uh, homolog pairing events, how they come together, how they come to part, apart dynamically. Um, where this, this, we have a paper under review that will go through all of the details. So in the interest of time, I'm actually going to um, skip this part. Okay, but let's just suffice it to say that the conclusion from this is that, um, that throughout meiosis, these chromosomes remain highly dynamic. Okay, and it is not just sort of a unpaired paired and then they just stick together, but the fluctuations proceed all the way through all the way to the end of meiosis. Okay, and so this is a highly stochastic process that, you know, sort of um, that, and that's why our sort of approach to looking at the dynamics is useful for interpreting these. Okay, so let me conclude here. Um, I actually was going to talk a little more about velocity autocorrelation, but again, I'm going to leave that off the table for now. Um, and the conclusions are here, but but what I really what's really important is for me to acknowledge uh, the students that did just really great work on this. Uh, my my former student Bruno Beltran uh, did all the theory work. Um, my collaborator is Sean uh, Burgess and her uh, postdoc Trent Newman. Uh, were the ones who contributed uh, the experimental results. Um, the active uh, polymer motion was uh, done by Ashesh Ghosh, a new uh, postdoc in my lab. Uh, funding is from NSF and I'll pause here and I'm happy to take any questions. All right, thank you Andy so much. So uh, let's, uh, let's try again, let's give the uh, virtual applause. Let's see if we get better at this. Yeah, I, I, I think we're getting there. I think it's certainly getting better. All right, thank you. Thank you, Andy, so much. This was fantastic. Um, so here is what's, um, what we are going to do now. Um, so we, we have listened to wonderful talks at the interface of physical sciences and biology uh, that included uh, some fundamental uh, research into genome structure, um, mathematical modeling, uh, and several other fundamental aspects. And um, we are going to have a panel, short panel discussion now, then uh, with, with, with Q&A related to those uh, talks as well. Um, and then we'll take a short break. And then uh, we'll have two more talks. And those two talks will be delivered by Song Lee from UCLA and Stanley Chi from Stanford. Uh, those two talks are focused on um, chromatin engineering, genome engineering. So you will hear how uh, some of those things we have just talked about uh, enhanced by state-of-the-art biotechnology concepts and technologies can lead to actual difference in uh, cell and organism function, the future of genomics, I would say. Um, so what I would like to do now is to invite all our speakers um, to a virtual panel, and then we'll take a break, and then we'll uh, have two more talks and uh, follow up, and then we conclude with Q&A related to the last uh, two talks. So I think uh, we, uh, we have Vivek, Andy, uh, Song, and Stanley. Uh, you're all part of the panel now. And, uh, and before, we, um, before we talk about, uh, I guess, some more common uh, questions, there is still uh, one underlying question that um, Drew wanted to go back to. So I, this might be a good time, uh, since we have Vivek here, uh, uh, to, to address. So Drew, do you want to uh, ask your question again? Yeah, so um, so I'm still confused as to how 
sticking these mesenchymal stem cells on a stiffer substrate decreases compaction. That is different than many other experiments. So the Wickstrom lab, uh, Hayden Malk, and then our own research. So how do you reconcile that? Because when you put things, uh, even when you put things in 3D environments, it's been shown that euchromatin gets upregulated in, in 3D environments and makes the, the nucleus softer overall. So why are you seeing different things than, than when the cell is mechanically challenged, it usually dials up heterochromatin to protect itself. So you're not seeing that when the cell is challenged by a stiffer substrate, it's actually getting softer, which is the exact opposite of many, many other labs. So how, how do you reconcile that difference? All right, uh, yeah, so Drew, thanks for that question. Uh, so just uh, one second here. So, uh, you know, so usually these days I've started moving my acknowledgement slides in the beginning. I realized I didn't, you know, I didn't do that. So I really want to, uh, so, uh, you know, so I want to acknowledge uh, Fareed, Zinyu, and Ayush. Uh, you know, this is a picture taken before the pandemic. So some of these people are not here. So I had to put Ayush. So, uh, so I really shout out to, uh, you know, these uh, students here. All right. So Drew, coming back to your uh, question. Um, so, uh, you know, so the data that I showed, so there are, uh, uh, there are few things we have to understand. So Wickstrom stuff is on epithelial cells. Epithelial mechanobiology and mechanotransduction is very different from mesenchymal, right? You don't have the stress fibers there. You don't have HDI. It's completely different. So, uh, so uh, you know, the fact that we are opposite to Wickstrom, no surprise there. And we are now working on epithelial uh, mechanobiology. And, uh, uh, you know, in fact, uh, we've, I've, been in, uh, I've been talking to uh, Sarah and her students. So, uh, you know, that, bring, that brings in completely new uh, phenomena that are not in here. So that, that, that's, that, that's that. And so, uh, so the data we have with Shiva and the data that uh, Rob and uh, Malike presented, exactly same, exactly the same. There is no uh, difference. On, 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 on stiff substrates, uh, you know, uh, you can view it many different ways. So how can chromatin organization change, uh, right? I mean, epigenetics is one piece of it. The, the actual volume of the nucleus is the other piece of it, because when you squeeze on the nucleus, fluid can flow in, flow out, and, uh, and things like that. So all of that, uh, you know, between the data we, you know, we published in, you know, series of PNAS articles with, uh, with Shiva, all of that uh, is consistent with Malike. Now you brought up Rob stuff. It's not consistent because it's dynamic loading. When you do, when you load a cell dynamically versus uh, you apply a static compressive stress versus you put on a substrate, you get different stress fiber organization. And, you know, and that's something we are looking at now. Some of these epigenetic factors may not have time to shuttle back and forth. So, so you have a situation where, you know, that has to come into the picture. So that's not being sorted out. That's a very good point. Uh, uh, you know, so I think I addressed the, dynamic, I address the epithelial, uh, I mean, you brought up other things. I'm not sure I caught all of them. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think that if we wanted to make it very simple, Malk and Hayo have been looking at this for the past five years, basically, and they do dynamic loading, but they've been arguing for five years that this, the, the bone, the human mesenchymal stem cells are under load, and that load helps them differentiate into their stiffer bone by increasing chromatin compaction, increasing lamins, right? Uh, and this all agrees with many other things in the field. And now you're coming in and you're saying, but if you stick it on a stiffer substrate, it does the exact opposite. So that's, I think no, there's I mean, something you know, to happening. Dynamic and static, they are, they are two different things. They're they are completely, you know, when you, uh, so the stress fiber organization on dynamic versus static is very, very different. Uh, right. So typically, if you apply static load, the cell will, you know, will, will align in one direction. The other case, it will align in the other direction. So the reason is there are there is the kinetics that comes with the formation of these uh, 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 these adhesions, the actomycin signaling, and some of the other stuff. So it's really a time scale problem. Uh, and I don't know if you've seen this. We have a paper in 2020, uh, you know, on effect of viscoelasticity. So. So I think the you know the the field is still trying to grapple some of these time scale issues, 
right? Uh, now, uh, when we are looking at uh, cells on stop versus stiff, so a lot of our stuff is fully considered Dennis Dishard stuff too. On stiff substrate, you get more lamin, you know, more nuclear lamin stiffening. All, all of that is consistent. So, so it's that time scale and these phenomena and the competition between them that really uh, it needs to be addressed. And uh, uh, yeah, so uh, so that that would be my answer because you don't know. Uh, so the time scales have to really come in. Right. I mean, I just think it would be great for in this presentation for you to talk about these different things. So now what I'm seeing basically is you might have a, a phenomenon where it's how much actomycin do you or actin do you have sort of in this cap. Um, and then also sort of mechanical stress that's applied to the cell and mechanotransduced, right? So we know that sort of stresses to the cell, mechanotransduced, active stresses, dynamic stresses, mechanotransduced into higher hydrochromatin signals, right? Can we agree on that? Uh, Dynamic. So again, okay, can, can you repeat? So high uh, again, uh, higher hit. Uh, so so you're saying more more uh, more. If you stress the cell, if because you stress the cell. Talk about stresses. There are two types of stresses: cell generated stresses and externally applied stresses. Right. I mean, uh, th these are two different things. So cell generated stresses, right, uh, will uh, will uh, actually always cause tension, laminar stiffening. And HDAC will go into the nucleus, you know. Uh, so as a consequence, on stiffer uh, it'll be looser, and on softer, uh, you, you, you know, uh, it, 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 it'll be more uh, chromatin will be condensed. Now, if you compress the cell, you're getting rid of uh, all the you're getting rid of all the uh, 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 the actomycin. So then you're make you're kind of going back to being on soft, right? Uh, so so there are many things here you got to worry about, right? It's not Force is a very loose concept, so you gotta you gotta distinguish between cell-generated force, applied force, whether it is tension, compression. I mean, there are all, all these different issues that come into the picture. So I I, I think what what I'm getting uh, out of this discussion is that I mean, there's a first of all, there's a fascinating topic, and I'm I love that we're having this discussion. It looks like uh, that there's more complexity in this problem than. Uh, what early studies wanted us to, to believe. And, and that's wonderful. And that's exactly how I think science should, should proceed. So there's actually exciting time that there are open questions. If there are no open questions, there's more. Answers, right? So. <laughs> right. And, and these are probably more complex processes, maybe not unidirectional processes uh, uh, as reductionist, like kind of classical reductionist biology would, would like the world to see. This is, this is real life. So I, I think this is a really, you know, wonderful that the uh, where where we are as as a community. So, and I would like to go back to this uh, shortly, but we have a couple of more questions, uh, and I think one of them is from Richard Knapp from the Western. He'd like to ask your question. I see Zach. I just will first want to say this was your talk was very very beautiful, uh, both on the experiments and on the modeling part. So my question is a bit about the modeling. So you use this phase field approach to essentially predict essentially what the amount of concentration of U and uh, heterochromatin is. And then close to the surface, and you add these epigenetic factors to essentially prevent that the, the domains grow indefinitely. So what, uh, what you actually saw was rather re regular patterns, which you also see when you do phase fields for block of polymer solutions and block and polymer solutions. I was wondering, can you make them more random by external forces? And secondly, how, how, what is the gradient which you have between the U-chromatin and the um, heterochromatin, because EALS and Vadim's model on uh, the uh, gene expression rate is dependent on the volume fraction. So I was thinking we maybe can use these concentrations then predict what the transcription rate is. And then final question is, is there any knowledge about how, how this phenomenon of the stiffening of the surface affects transcription? All right, right. So, uh, uh, you know, so let's, uh, you know, so the very first question was, uh, why we, uh, you know, is it similar to Kobach polymer? Uh, and I think it is. Uh, I think it absolutely is. Uh, but the important difference, again, I'm not, I'm not, you know, I, I don't come from the co-block polymer field. So, uh, so again, my understanding of it is that uh, uh, those chemical reactions, uh, you know, like methylation and acetylation, maybe they are present there too. I'm not, I'm not entirely sure. No, no, no. So the, the, the phase field of uh, formalism, you can also apply just to. Quite some non-chemical active uh, 
polymers in solution and they will phase separate. And that's what Absolutely. you would try to see. Absolutely. But you, your epinetic factor essentially pre prevents phase separation over macros, over macro scales, right? It, 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 it presents phase separation over macro scale. I mean, we are dealing with a very coarse grain system on a macro scale, right? So, so it does. And the more important thing, what those epigenetic factors do is that actually gives the phase separation a length scale, right? Because, mm -hmm. yes. uh, because it, you know, if you don't have that there, it will just coarse, right? And and that's what the that problem is. Then it would indefinitely yes, coarse. Yes. And you essentially. Right. Um, restrict yeah, the system to a certain it, length. Exactly. Scale. Yeah. Yeah. And here it actually gives it, gives it a length scale. And that length scale depends on the micron mm -hmm. right? Because uh, because of the shuttling phenomena. So that, 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 that's really what, uh, what is new, uh, right? Uh, in, mm -hmm. in what I did. And, and also the fact that, uh, you know, we view this uh, lab formation as a wetting phenomena, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but in classical wetting without this uh, non-equilibrium uh, physics, they, you know, you'll either get uh, you know, you'll get these droplets and, uh, you know, they will coarsen too. Here they are stable against coarsening. You can either get a, a fixed uh, droplet size and, uh, you know, you can also get a thickness of that. All of that seems, at least at this stage, to be consistent with the simple static experiments that Malike has. Mm -hmm. As Drew pointed out, there are a lot more complications here once you bring in dynamic uh, loading, right? So it remains to be studied. I mean, you asked some other questions as well. Uh, again, I don't uh, so, know. Well, the thing is, because you, the, essentially the phase separation rests, there will be no coarsening. You still have a kind of, you showed all these nice patterns, but there was right, just, right. How, how, how binary are these phase separations? So how, yeah, how much uh, is the concentration of the euchromatin versus the heterochromatin? Oh, uh, so if you, I mean, th th that's actually quite, uh, so if you, am I sharing screen? No. No, not at the moment. No. Right, 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 right. Uh, yeah, so Rickard, if you, uh, you know, if you go to, uh, where is it? Uh, yes. If you go to this equation, right, mm -hmm. and if you integrate this over all space, right, you can actually prove that the net amount of hetero to you is decided by this ratio, gamma methylation divided by, so, so when you integrate this all, all space, all of this will vanish. And then what you will show is that the acetylation and methylation rates will decide how much net U and hetero you have, right? So with increasing uh, acetylation, uh, you know, you're going to get more U. Mm -hmm. When you decrease it, you get, and, and it can be independently controlled, uh, right? By changing these two things. Because you see this direction is, uh, uh, you know, is catalyzed by certain en enzymes, these by others, right? Mm -hmm. it, HDAC, HMTs, there are four, four of these things. So, so you can sort of control that. So even the morphology will depend on, on acetylation and methylation. So this actually is a stable morphology. And you see these kind of patterns. Here you get a different pattern. Now, uh, the periodicity is a very important thing because you're assuming everything is uniform. We didn't put any noise into this. Mm -hmm. If you start putting noise into it, if you, uh, you know, if you start giving some, then you're experimentally, you're not seeing everything completely uniform, right? That's just a artifact of the model we are assuming everything is homogeneous in real life nothing is homogeneous things but at least it's a conceptual thing that you can actually get an expression in this case say for the thickness of this layer in a model with few few parameters we only have these things to play with if you start bringing spatial dependence then you'll make it more complex and maybe it resembles experiments closely but you lose that sort of simplicity well, thank you. Uh, so I saw a hand, uh, uh, Son, you, you had a hand. I don't know if you had a question or you wanted to make a comment. Son Lee? Oh, yeah. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, great. Actually, I uh, just want, wanted to make a comment. Uh, I think you raised a very important question about the, the uh, discrepancy among different studies. Indeed, uh, in the literature, there are so many different conditions, uh, different kind of loadings. In, I also want to echo what uh, Vivek uh, Shinoi mentioned. I think indeed the cell type makes a big difference. In some studies, you have epithelial monolayer there. Uh, in some of them, you have mesenchymal cells uh, in 2D or 3D ma ma matrix. In addition, if you have a, a different cell morphology, then we have found that, for example, if you have polarity in cells in a bipolar shape versus a, a, a nonpolar uh, morphology, in the cell will respond differently. So if you apply a force from the top or from the side, and this, the, the, the effect uh, is dependent not only how, how you apply this force, but also the magnitude. 
So as uh, as uh, really mentioned that uh, the, there there will be some uh, yielding in, in the deformation of the cells in nuclei itself depends on whether it's constrained or not. So all of these factors could make difference. So I will show some data when we remove all of these cell adhesions. Uh, uh, what will happen if you have a pure mechanical uh, squeezing of the cells and nucleus? And hopefully, we can discuss more. Well, that, that, I think everybody will be very much excited to, to see that. So, um, in uh, to keep us on time, let's take one more question from the audience, and I'll, I'll uh, conclude with one uh, last question. I think uh, Basandra Agarwal from Northwestern had a question. Um, yeah, um, my question is for Dr. Uh, Shinoi, a uh, really inspiring talk today. Um, so you mentioned that the changes in chromatin in MSCs that are cultured on these materials with different stiffness happen through changes in histone modifications. Uh, and in this case, the nuclear morphology wasn't changing much. So uh, when you apply mechanical forces that do change the nucleus, uh, we know that one of the pathways involves this direct pr propagation from the cytoskeleton uh, through the link complex into the nucleus to change the chromatin and transcription. And another hypothesis that you did mention was uh, that the cytoskeletal reorganization may, may also cause this shuttling of epigenetic modifiers like HDAC3 into the nucleus from the cytoplasm. So what do you think might be the mechanism in this case? I think it uh, goes back to what Song uh, pointed out. You know, there's some really nice uh, uh, work that, uh, uh, that, that that actually from Ning Wang that actually shows that uh, if you get a magnetic bead and really pull on the you know pull on a, the cell membrane, right? Those forces can actually be transmitted to the nucleus, and then that can lead to chromatin pulling. Right, uh, so you're absolutely right. What I presented is only a very partial picture. Uh, it's far from uh, complete and it's very complex. You know, it's very hard to say. Uh, or I'm, you know, again, uh, so the way we look at it is uh, at, at least a zero total level, we can understand the sizes of the domains uh, in the interior, the thickness of the lamin with some simple uh, models, right? And we have just barely scratched the surface. So there's a lot more to do and everything that you said is, uh, uh, you know, is relevant and uh, you know, will be looked at carefully uh, you know, in the future. Thank you. And uh, one, I have one, uh, I guess, <clears throat> semi philosophical question and perhaps I will address it to Andy and then the rest of the, the other panelists, uh, Son and Vivek, uh, please feel free to comment on this. I remember back in the uh, late 90s, <clears throat> uh, I read an article written by uh, a prominent physicist and a prominent geneticist. And their argument was that uh, physics and biology was going to play a significant role. But while for biologists, it's all about DNA and proteins, for phys physicists should stay away from those things. They're too complex. And physics would never be able to address any of those things. They should focus on uh, lipids, things like lipid membrane, and uh, something the biologists don't care much about, or at least not as much. Uh, and that's what they should should, should do. Um, and uh, you know, I think what we have seen in the past few years, and I think this the talks that that we heard today, I think fairly clearly show that these predictions by two very prominent and smart people, uh, I don't think they were correct. Um, so where do you see the next, uh, in terms of physics uh, and physical sciences and engineering in, in genomics, where do you see the next uh, major frontier? And maybe Andrew, you can, you can start and then we hear from the rest of the panel. Oh, that's a, that's a, <laughs> that's a great question. Um, it's, uh, um, okay, so now, now I get to say something that say 20, 20 years from now, people are gonna be saying how wrong I was in, in a symposium like this, where, where they get to say, where they get to quote me. Um, and, oh, and, and, and for the record, um, you know, I think there's, there's amazing, uh, amazing work on understanding lipids and, and assembly and membranes. And for example, uh, Egal Schleifer uh, has done, uh, 
just, you know, really inspiring work, uh, you know, on, in this area and somebody in the audience, that's an example of, of somebody bringing insight to the, in that area of study. Um, okay, so I, I mean, I think that, um, so, so to, you know, certainly I think that, uh, you know, it's, it is really critical um, I mean, all of all of the the work that's being presented, you know, today, both experimental and and you know, theoretical work, um, is you know is is shedding light on, you know, these you know the impact of physical forces on on cell, cellular processes, you know, and and I think that um, one thing that I I is really inspiring is from you know from all of these works, you know, f whether it's the imaging capabilities that have been coming, that have been revolutionized, revolutionizing our, our study of, of biology to, you know, um, to various theoretical approaches that that are are very useful at, in in providing fundamental insight. I mean, I think that um, the, the you know the critical component to all of these is that um, the the focus on one single protein playing one single role is 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 being challenged by all of these you know collective studies which i think you know that's that's one area that physics uh physical insight has been really essential for um and i think you know these talks this morning about the um the extracellular matrix and what role it plays in modulating the internal structure and and behavior is um is is very you know reminiscent of that of, of that insight that you can get into collective behavior. I think that, you know, moving forward, being able to reconcile, you know, everything from, you know, molecular to cells to tissues is, is an essential, is an essential thing for organismal, you know, under, understanding how organisms actually behave. Uh, and I think that this is where right now we're sort of right at the cusp of being able to do those sorts of things just based on the fundamental insights that experimentalists and theorists, for example, what was presented earlier today, um, are able to do. So to answer your question, I would say being able to, you know, um, reconcile disparate length and time scales and doing that from molecular to tissue to organism is, is, mm -hmm. is re we're really at an exciting time for that. So that's my answer. Well, thank you. <clears throat> By the way, thank you so much for bringing up uh, Egal's excellent work on uh, computational uh, biophysics work, uh, uh, molecular theory work on, on lipids. Uh, I, I think uh, Egal is here and uh, that's clearly a very significant uh, contribution. Uh, so um, any of the other panelists want to comment on this with Eric Stanley Song? Maybe I will just say a couple of uh, things. So, um, you know, biology is, uh, from a point of view of computation, becomes sort of a big data kind of a enterprise, right? Uh, so there was this uh, meeting that uh, the NHGRI organized recently that I attended. So there's so much data coming out on the nucleus, right? High C, RNA C, chip C, tax C, all, 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 all of those sorts of things, right? And so when, when you look at that, and uh, you know, there's a army of people using machine learning to understand that. So I think, again, very briefly, I think this sort of connection between, because that is so complex, machine learning is essential, but I think that also needs to be supplemented by physics. And I don't think a lot of the big funding agencies at NIH or the funding managers at NIH have gotten that sense, except for a few people we know. So I think, uh, you know, with the center that you have, Adim, and the center we have, we really want to bring physics to the front, right? Uh, machine learning is fine, but it's a black box, right? Mm -hmm. so, uh, some of the things that, uh, you know, the scaling and all those kind of things have, are very powerful and have played a big role in, in uh, you know, in soft matter, solid state physics. So it should play a role in biology as well. Oh, beautifully stated. Uh, so I see a hand, hi. Uh, I think it's a great discussion. Um, I want to echo what the uh, Andrew and Vivek uh, just mentioned. One is a fundamental understanding of all of these uh, uh, mechanisms. And, and with the advancement of technologies, I think uh, we could have a uh, high resolution, uh, especially the spatial 
I think this, the spatial resolution is very important. As, as we have seen, this high resolution imaging technology can give us a lot of information. In addition, I think the, the live cell imaging to monitor the changes uh, in how fast it could change and what is the rate of change and what other factors can result in these changes. And those are important as well. I think another important direction is translation. And I think we are ready. You know, with this uh, uh, understanding of mechanobiology, you know, people already talk about mechanomedicine and we can talk about all the mechano uh, biotechnologies that could be used uh, to uh, do cell engineering and do cell processing, et cetera. I think that uh, it will be a future direction as well. Very well. And, and I think uh, two upcoming talks uh, will address uh, some of those uh, translational issues as well um, in Stanley. Right, I don't want to take too much time. <laughs> I don't want to like uh, really echo what being said here. I think it's not easy to just directly apply a lot of physics to explain the very complicated biology, especially in the cellular and the tissue level. But, but on the other hand, it, the fundamental principles of the physics and the chemistry always hold. And the question is just where to find them. Like for example, like a lot of biology starting the genomics uh, focus on sequence, right? They, they don't have information about temporal and uh, space and time, I would say, right? Which are the two fundamental parameters in physics we always care about. And, uh, but that's because of part of because of missing technology or because we haven't been there yet, but doesn't mean that they are not important or impossible to study. Another example would be like uh, the uh, phase condensation Free separation these years being used as a fundamental understanding to start some question. Whether or not for every biological question, we can use, apply this free separation to explain, that's a question. But it really leads to some new thinking and new testing about some hypothesis, which is I'm very excited about. So this type of physical investigation will be groundbreaking for the biological research. Thank you. Thank you so much. That, that, those are very, very good comments, and I'm sure we'll get back to them um, after the uh, uh, after the uh, after your talks, uh, uh, Stanley's talk, and uh, Song's talks are completed. We, we can go back to some of those issues. Um, so I, we're a little behind the schedule, but we're actually not bad. We're actually quite uh, reasonably good. Uh, so why don't we take six minute break and uh, reconvene? Uh, promptly at 11.40 Central Time, 12.40 uh, Eastern Time, and uh, I think Son Lee uh, will be your time to talk, and we'll take a few minute break now.